Washington Capitals as the Blues lose their third straight game. First time they've gone on a three-game losing streak since Drew Bannister took over. Alongside Tanner Hendrickson, I'm Alex Ferrario. We are here at the ENB Granite Studios at Centene Community Ice Center where the Blues will be practicing in about 30 minutes or so. We've got Grant Francis back in our 101 ESPN Studios taking care of us today. We're live up on our YouTube channel at 101 ESPN STL. And last night we saw the same trend that happened against the Philadelphia Philadelphia Flyers that happened against the Boston Bruins. Now, the Boston Bruins was a game that the Blues fought their way back into, forced overtime, and lost. But they made some mistakes in the game that costed them and forced them to have to come from behind three separate times. The Philadelphia Flyers game, it was mistakes in the second and third period that put the Blues behind an eight ball that they were unable to come back in. And last night, it felt like the Blues had no opportunity to come back into that Washington Capitals game. Some of it was special teams, but most most of it was the the indecisiveness with the puck on their stick. And we're back to seeing the Blues deciding when they want to play hockey games. Because you ended that game last night with 20 shots on goal. You were outshot in both the second and third period. Both periods, by the way, you were trailing in. You were outshot 10 to 7 by Washington in the second and outshot 8 to 5 in the third period. By the way, third period was straight even strength, but second period, you had one more power play than the Washington Capitals and you were outshot 10 to 7. Not ideal. Not ideal at all. But it's back to seeing a Blues team that starts out slow. The opponent pushes early. The Blues get a little bit of life, but then it's a little too late for the Blues team and they fall to the waist side. And it's a trend that we saw a lot the first chunk of the season. It's what got Craig Berube fired. And it's a trend that we're starting to see seep back into the Blues game. And if you don't believe me, here was Drew Bannister last night against the Washington Capitals. I think it's, it wasn't really what they were doing. I, I just I don't think we were very predictable in getting pucks underneath uh, things that we talked about as a group, putting pucks to areas that we can get to, you know, and, and sustaining ozone pressure. And, and that's that's something that collectively as a group they they have to decide that they want to do if if we want to have success moving forward. So nice, we'll play it twice for you there. Deciding when they want to do it. That's a quote that we heard so much from Craig Berube and T-Bone. It's now a quote that we've heard multiple times from Drew Bannister. Yeah, you're starting. I, I totally agree with you. And, and watching that game last night, I think we brought this up. I don't remember when they played their first game this week. That, that's how much these games are yeah. blending together at this point. I remember earlier this week when BK was here, we brought up, you know, are they losing that new coach bump where it's like, Hey, the new guys in town, you know, we disappointed our previous coach. We're, we got to go out there. We got to showcase ourselves. We got to go out there. We got to just compete our ass off. They're back to being the same team. Yeah. And it's happened, as you mentioned, three times, three game losing streak to where I watch these games now and it's like, okay, I don't know what I'm going to get. You don't know what you're going to get from the Blues. There is no consistency. And I'm not even talking about their play on the ice. We can get into that later on as well. But whether or not they're just going to come out and compete. And that's just a winning mentality. And right now, they're back to not having that. They're back to just saying, "All right, let's see. Let's we'll see where we're at in this game." But let, let, you know what? Are they? Are they? Are they ready to play? Because if they're ready to play, I'm not sure we're ready to play. It, they are seeping back into who they were before Craig Berube, and it, it it's frustrating. And you can tell it's frustrating in Drew Bannister's voice because yeah. he doesn't he he's stuck with the roster that he is given, and he sees the same thing that I'm sure Craig Berube saw towards the end of his tenure of. I don't know how I'm going to get these guys motivated to go out there and play. And when you have to ask that as a head coach, it just tells you that the roster as a whole is in a very bad place and that the organization is in a very bad place. There were so many other factors into this game that you noticed with the compete. And Grant Francis and I were talking about this on the broadcast. There were two hits in the game by the Blues in the first two periods. Now, I think they finished with five total in that game. And look, when you have the puck, you're not expected to hit people. That's why uh, Washington in that game had seven hits because they possessed the puck. I think Natural Stat Trick said they possessed the puck at even strength like 65% of the time. But when you possess the puck, you don't need to hit. But the compete factor is when you're only laying two hits against the competition, well, you're not fighting to get the puck back. We've heard Steve Ott use the phrase, invest in goal line opportunities and net front presence. Drew Bannister talked about it. You heard it on that post-game press conference saying, we got to decide when we want to do what we want to do to win hockey games. When your fourth line outshoots 
your second line and your third line when your defensemen outshoot all four of your lines offensively. Your defenseman last night had a total of seven shots on goal. The, wow. top, the top line of Thomas Buchnevich and Neighbors had six shots on goal. Now, attempts, there were a lot more of them. I'm not saying that these guys aren't shooting the puck. They're not hitting the net. Only six times that top line hit the net. Only three times the second line hit the net. That was Shen Hayes and Cairo. Only one time, and a lot of this is because they spent so much time on the power play, Saad Sundquist and Gaudette hit the net. And then your fourth line, Torpchenko, Alexandrov, and Nathan Walker had four shots on goal. But your defensemen outshot your offensemen in that game trying to create scoring opportunities. You weren't investing in the opportunity to win the puck battles, to win the four check. You were turning the puck over at the blue line. You were making bad decisions that Drew Bannister has talked about with the puck on your stick, and it led to odd man rushes the other way. Again, it's a trend that plagued the Blues in the early portion of the season, and it's what they got away from for a good 12 or 13 games. It's how you beat Colorado. It's how you beat Vegas or uh, Vancouver. It's how you beat the Dallas Stars. Tonight or last night, there was no physicality. There was no ability to win puck battles, and there was no sustained offensive zone time. It was one and done while Washington skated around you in circles. Yeah, no, no willingness to dump the puck in and go get it. And Bannister said that post game too. You know, I. It's tough seeing them revert back to this because their four minute, you saw them kind of yeah. show showcase what they can do. And, the, and Army had made reference to that in his post game presser of, no, I think this team still has some talent. What our ceiling is, I'm not quite sure, but I know we've got talent. And then it kind of came out under Bannister early on. And again, they're just back to themselves. And it is so, so confounding to see how a, a whole team can kind of have this persona because it's one thing if you had like one, like a I hate to say his name but it's Drew Vrana a Yakub Vrana type player that is like you know what I'm gonna see when I show up if I'm gonna play any defense and if I'm scoring goals you know what who cares if I'm playing defense or not and I'm not saying that everybody on this team does it because I think there are a handful of guys that compete night in night out Thomas Shin uh, I would throw Booch into that category I would throw Pareko into that category Hell, Benner belongs in that category because he's the only reason that they're not one of the worst teams in the NHL. Amen to that. Um, but for the most part, a lot of these guys, it is back into the same conversation of, do I want to play tonight? And I just can't fathom going through that. And Army mentioned this post uh, after the Craig Ruby firing as well of, yeah. I don't care what your job is. No matter what you're doing, you need to show up and show up to work and do your job at the best of your ability when you go into the office. And the Blues are back to kind of showing up and just kind of going 50 percent a lot of the time and just determining it whether or not is tonight the night that we want to play and then going on like these one game road trips that that's the thing what you saw them do early on in Bruby as well where it was now nah, one game now nah, you know we can make up for that later on when we get back home it's just it, it's inexcusable and it's it's incredibly frustrating to watch and i can't imagine what it is how frustrating it is for doug armstrong to see this team go back to it after he's changed coaches and I feel bad for Drew Bannister that's had to come in and take over this mess. Yeah, we, uh, we're we getting a lot of texts on the Air Comfort Service text line, 314-399-9646, talking about how the special teams is the reason the Blues lost that game the last night has nothing to do with even strength. No, it has everything to do with even strength. We'll get to the special teams play, but we've seen this team win without special teams this season. And how did they do that? They eliminated the competition at even strength, and when they gave power play opportunities, they killed that one off. They didn't accomplish that last night. You had seven shots on goal on the power play, two shots on goal shorthanded, and 11 shots on goal at even strength. 11 shots on goal at even strength. There were 18 minutes of power play and penalty kills last night. So, like, I understand special teams, but that means 42 minutes of that game was played at even strength, and you came away with 11 shots on goal. And that leads me to the next point. And, and, and real quick, before we get to that, sure, the power play did cost them, and the penalty kill did cost them last night. I, I get that. But you know why the power play cost them last night? Because it was lackadaisical. It was lackadaisical. It wasn't the same power play we've seen under Bannister previously yeah, where they've been scoring in the goals. last three games. Exactly. It wasn't that. They they struggled with zone time. It was bad passing. It was not enough shots on goal for the amount of power play time that they had. Yes. I think both things can be true here at the same time. Did the special teams cost them that game last night? Yes. Is that a common theme throughout the season? Yes. Did I think that the power play was necessarily like full max effort last night? No, I thought it was lackadaisical. Has that been an issue all season long? Yes, very much so. So 
We've heard a lot about accountability, and I want to go back to that press conference that Doug Armstrong held when Craig Berube was let go. He was asked the question what he wants from his next coach. What we want to stress as we're going through whatever we're going through now is a, a level of compete and a level of accountability. And whoever, starting with Drew tomorrow night, that's his mandate. Accountability and compete. So we just talked about the compete level, and that was there for the longest time. And now in three games, I could argue two and a half games because most of that Boston Bruins game, it was there. Uh, but Philadelphia, Washington, it was not. But now let's get to the accountability. And Drew Bannister has mastered this, I think, since he took over. He sat Pavel Buchnevich in a game. We saw him scratch Sammy, or uh, not Sammy Blay, Yakub Verana after the mistake he made in the Florida Panthers game. We've seen him keep Matt Kessel in the game and give him a lot of minutes because he's played so well but I think it's time to take the accountability to the next level because what we're seeing now for the Blues isn't so much mistakes by young players mistakes by guys that are putting the team in bad position you're seeing veterans make mistakes you're seeing veterans turn the puck over at the blue line you're seeing fourth liners Nathan Walker Alexi Toropchenko uh, Oscar Sundquist outplay some of your top guys and Curbs and Joey talked about this at the end of the second period and I know they didn't get a power play in the third period but if they would have I would have expected Drew Bannister to go a power play of Nathan Walker Oscar Sundquist uh, Jake Neighbors Adam Gaudet and Colton Pareko because those were the only guys that seemed to have that compete in them you've seen struggles from a lot of your veteran defensemen you've seen turnovers by veteran players in the offensive zone and you've seen that lack of effort with guys not shooting the puck if i'm drew banister i'm the interim head coach i've shown my accountability accountability prowess already i'm not afraid to do it again it might come to scratching somebody that shouldn't be scratched it might come to putting somebody on the fourth line that's a top line player but right now there's a message that needs to be clear to these players if i'm drew banister that if you're not going to compete you're not playing in the game yeah i and it's going to be tough for him to make that decision and why do i say it's going to be tough to make that decision because there's a lot of guys that yeah. you can almost throw there's into a, this category very much so it, it's not like one guy when they were playing well they're down uh recently and it was clear like the verona situation that you brought up it was clear okay that was a major mistake that he needs to be up in the press box for again last night was almost a whole team effort in terms of a lack of compete so I agree with what you're saying. It is probably going to be, will he consider sending a message to one of the top players on this roster? We'll see. I think he's done a great job in terms of the accountability. As I you do. mentioned, the Buchnevich uh, benching in that third period. I'll be curious to see, because it is the first three-game losing streak, as you mentioned. I'll be curious to see if there's some kind of lineup change tonight as, as they're practicing here in about 15 minutes. I'll be curious if there's somebody that's been bumped down a line because of what we're talking about. I don't expect him to go the route of sitting someone um, I don't like think a you veteran. Can, I don't think I, you can sit somebody is the problem. Exactly. I, but I will be curious to see if there is some like lineup change that when we see the lines combinations out today at practice that we go, okay, there it is. There he is kind of sending a message. I, I, we'll see. We'll yeah. see if he does it again, though. With that being said, I still think he's done a pretty good job of the accountability. Uh, side I do things. too. And this has nothing to do with Drew Bannister. I think he's mastered it, but I think he's got to take it to the next level. You've got Marco Scandella who's been sitting these last couple of games. I don't know who you sit, but maybe you have to pull a Justin Falk out of the line up until he gets going. Although I know Drew Bannister said he liked his game last night. Uh, maybe Sammy Blay goes back into the lineup for somebody that's not competing to the level that he needs. But right now, something needs to change in terms of where this team's at because, again, you're back to a three-game losing streak where the Blues did a really good job of avoiding that for the longest time. But now you're starting to leak into that territory, and it's the worst time to do it, as we talked about with Joe Vitale, of you needing to pick up points if you're going to be in a playoff conversation. Plenty more Blues conversation coming your way throughout the day today. Tanner Hendrickson, we've got Graham Francis back in our studios. I'm Alex Ferrario, but coming up next, Next, as we head into the divisional round weekend, when we look at the four quarterbacks that are in action, what does it tell us about each conference? We'll discuss that and Josh Allen specifically, what a win could do for him coming up next year on 101 ESPN.
So we head into divisional round in the NFL. It's some really good games on slate this weekend as you're going to have Brock Purdy going up against Jordan Love, Jared Goff going up against Baker Mayfield. Uh, no surprise when T-Bone and I were talking uh, before the show. We tried to remember who the hell uh, Jared Goff was taking on, and it's the most forgettable team still in the playoffs. That would be the Tampa Bay Buccaneers. But then you got Lamar Jackson going up against C.J. Stroud and Josh Allen, Patrick Mahomes. I think that's the, the pay-per-view, the heavyweight bout in this weekend's games. But when you look at all four of these quarterbacks in each conference going head-to-head this weekend, T-Bone, what does it tell you about the state of the NFC and AFC? Because for me... I know that the NFL is in a great spot. I mean, if you just look at the names that we just listed, it does not include Joe Burrow's name. It does not include Jalen Hurts' name. It does not include a Trevor Lawrence's name. It does not include a Tua's name. And, like, those are the other four names. Justin Herbert's the other one that I just brought up. Those names are the ones that everybody talks about in the NFL, and they're not even showcased in the postseason right now. For me... I guess specifically I look at the AFC when you've got the three big names that now C.J. Stroud has entered the mix. Man, the NFL's in a good spot with quarterbacks that are able to take teams that otherwise thought were probably not even in the conversation in terms of building something now is actually viewed as a team that can go on and build some type of championship prowess. Yeah, what this tells me is that if you're in the AFC, you have to have just a franchise quarterback. Yeah. And I look at the NFC and I go, you know what? You can be competitive with, like, the stopgap guy. Yeah. Like, we all agree. Like, I think Mayfield's going to get paid this offseason. We can all agree, hey, he's not the answer in the NFC. Is, is, there, is there a franchise quarterback in the NFC? I mean, Jalen Hurts. Purdy. I think Purdy. Yeah. Oh, in the in the NFC, I'd say Purdy and Gaw or Love, I would say. I'm still up in the air if golf is like the true yeah. long-term solution. And I mean, Jalen Hurts, who's not in the playoffs, Dak Prescott, but I'm starting to question that one right now. Like, if you're going to win in the AFC, what this tells me is you basically have to have a top 10 quarterback. Because the names that are left, Jackson, Allen, Mahomes, and Stroud. I mean, you mentioned the other names in the AFC. Herbert, uh, you've got... Uh, Trevor Lawrence, who I we'll see. Yeah, who knows what that one. Of him. By the way, Aaron Rodgers is going to be back yeah. uh, next year with Joe the New Burrow, York Jets. Anthony Richardson Burrow's going to be back. Richardson looked really good when he was healthy this year. Like if you're going to compete in the AFC, you need to have the franchise quarterback and probably a top ten quarterback if you're going to be able to go on a run. You can maybe make the playoffs, but you're going to be like the Pittsburgh Steelers, where you're going to be there and you're going to go, look at us, we're here. And the they a- Kenny Pickett. Yeah, exactly. They need a quarterback. <laughs> you would be like the Pittsburgh Steelers if you don't have the franchise guy to where maybe you can sneak in, maybe you sneak in with a stopgap quarterback, and then they're just going to look at you and go, you don't really belong here, and you're going to get the crap kicked out of you, right. as we saw with the Pittsburgh Steelers. In the NFC, like, Purdy love golf and Mayfield. Of those four, you compare those four, you put those guys in the AFC, Purdy, Love, Goff, oh, maybe those three I can think they're, be competitive on like some teams in the AFC. But I think they're sixth. I think all of those guys are below the four that are in the playoffs right now, and I would put at least all of them below Joe Burrow. Yeah, I, I'm with you. I, I think it shows you that right now in the NFC, the NFC is – completely wide open because we thought going into the year you know like Matthew Stafford was going to be what the third best quarterback potentially in the NFC at least an argument for and he played great this past weekend against the Detroit Lions in that loss but this tells me that the AFC is just loaded and stacked that it is going to be really hard to come out of the AFC if you're the NFC and you kind of make an all-in push you can suddenly become one of the favorites because I think there's only one. Ju- I think there's one juggernaut in all of the NFL, and it happens to be the San Francisco 49ers. The rest of the NFC is wide open. I think the AFC is wide open, yeah. but in a competitive stance. What's interesting too is like that juggernaut that is the 49ers. It's not even because it's Brock Purdy. Yeah. Like I think you could put any quarterback on that team, and I would say they're a juggernaut because of what their defense looks like, because of Kyle Shanahan, and because of the weapons that they have. Here's an interesting thought. What happens when Caleb Williams enters this conversation, which I'm assuming he's going to be drafted by the Chicago Bears, um, and when, let's say, Drake May, if he gets drafted by the Washington Commanders? Do those two at least, and obviously they're going to have to back it up on the field, but do they enter that conversation if they back it up after that first season? If they back it up, sure. But like, but right we're now- talking C.J. Stroud back it up. Yeah. Yes, because like, see, if you put C.J. Stroud, let's say, on the Bears, for example, and he played the way he's played this year, oh, yeah, he'd which be I, number one. 
where would he rank in the NFC in terms of quarterbacks? I would probably – he'd be top three. I mean, yeah. he'd be right up there in the conversation with Matthew Stafford. He'd be in the conversation with uh, – and then I think the other top two, I mean, again, they didn't – Dak was not good this right. year in the playoffs, but – Dak and Hurts. Like, he'd be a top three quarterback. You could easily make the case for C.J. Stroud to be a top three quarterback in the NFC. If you were to take him, like, in the AFC, you could still make that argument because I think you you have every right to say you take him number one for the next five years yeah. because of the way he's played as a rookie. Mm -hmm. But when you look at who he's going up against in the AFC, it's Josh Allen, Joe Burrow, Patrick Mahomes. Like, those are... Those three, throw in Justin Herbert, Trevor Lawrence, who are kind of in the, on the side, Anthony Richardson kind of in on the side, um, Aaron Rodgers when he comes back and we'll see what he looks like healthy. By the way, I haven't even mentioned Lamar. Yeah. Uh, like, that's a loaded AFC conference where C.J. Stroud, by this time next year, could be the number one quarterback if he was on a, a quality NFC team. So you got some good matchups like we mentioned, but the one that everybody's going to be talking about going into the weekend is Josh Allen versus Patrick Mahomes. It's the first time Patrick Mahomes has played a playoff game on the road. There's a lot of pressure on Josh Allen to win this one because this is this is the Chicago Blackhawks of the St. Louis Blues in the mid-2010s uh, because they could never get past them. Josh Allen's kryptonite is Patrick Mahomes and the Kansas City Chiefs. Does it change your opinion on him if he pulls out a victory this weekend against Kansas City? I, would it track you if I said no? Yes. Because it, I... It would, because I... I mean, I, I think it's... It's impossible for me not to put him in that top conversation of the quarterback if you beat Patrick Mahomes. Because you're going head-to-head -head with the guy. Now, I'm not saying he's better than Patrick Mahomes. Patrick Mahomes still is clear-cut day, every day of the week better than Josh Allen. But let's say Josh Allen picks up a victory against the Kansas City Chiefs and Lamar Jackson picks up a victory against the, the Houston Texans. I, I, I think after a victory against Patrick Mahomes in Kansas City, I'm going to be looking a lot more intently at Josh Allen and what he did compared to Lamar Jackson beating C.J. Stroud and the Texans. That That is fair, but the reason that I say it doesn't change much for me on Josh Allen is be, it's kind of twofold. Really, I, I think this Buffalo team is a better all-around roster than the Kansas City Chiefs. I think Kansas City's got a great defense. Their offense, though, to me, is still underwhelming. Right. So, And there's a reason that – and the other thing is Buffalo's favorite in this game. Buffalo's a three-point favorite at home against the Kansas City Chiefs. I think they should win this weekend. Now, I think it's going to be close, but I still believe that they should win this this weekend against Kansas City Chiefs. I think where Allen is going to get judged is more of can he get the team to the Super Bowl. And that's why I think, like, no matter who he faces next week, whether it's Lamar, C.J. Stroud, if they win, that's where there's going to be more pressure of, okay, can you get your team to the promised land? He loses to Mahomes. I think it, then there's more of a storyline to it. But I, I, I think a win over Mahomes this weekend doesn't do much, in my opinion, because I'm still going to say, okay, I kind of expected that because I never really was in on the Chiefs this year, even though BK's huge on them this weekend. Oh, yeah. He's already put it out on social media that they're winning by 10, and I can't yeah. root harder for Buffalo. Exactly. I, I, I haven't been sold on the Chiefs this year, and that's why I say a win for Josh Allen, it doesn't maybe impact how I view maybe just slightly. But it's not enough to where, like, if he can get his team to the Super Bowl. that That's where I stand on it. Yeah, well, they're in action on Sunday. Uh, Chiefs and Bills, Sunday afternoon, Buccaneers and Lions. And if I'm not mistaken, we've got both of those games right here on 101 ESPN. More NFL talk coming your way in the 1 o'clock hour. Coming up next, though, we've heard about Tommy Edmonds' wrist, and we've talked about the impact it could have on the offensive side. What's the trickle-down effect if his wrist impacts the defensive side for the Cardinals? We'll get to that next and possibly another roster move coming here on 101 ESPN.
Grant Francis here with a Sports Center update driven by Johnny Londoff Chevrolet and Johnny Londoff Autoplex. Last night, the Blues were in Washington taking on the Capitals. Nathan Walker had two goals in the game, but the difference was a TJ Oshie hat trick as the Capitals beat the Blues 5 to 2. Blues have now lost 3 games in a row, and they'll be back in our uh, in action tomorrow night as they welcome back the Capitals to St. Louis this time. Pre-game will be at 6 o'clock, puck drop at 7 here on your home for the Blues, 101 ESPN. I'm Grant Francis. The Sports Center update has been driven by Johnny Londoff. Find your roads and shop 24-7 at Londoff.com and LondoffAutoplex.com. Are you kidding me? Alongside Tanner Hendrickson and Graham Francis, I'm Alex Ferrario. We are live here at the E&B Granite Studios at the Centene Community Eye Center. Blues just got underway with their practice. We'll update you if anything changes from their line shifts. But let's get into a little Cardinals talk now because we learned the offseason from John Denton's reporting uh, that Tommy Edmond had offseason wrist surgery. It was to clear up some, uh, some bone and some cartilage issues and just to have him ready for the season. And in John Denton's piece, Tommy Edmond said, quote, I'm very confident I'll be ready for this season. He's already shed the 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 uh, cast that he was wearing as protection for the wrist. And he talked about the next step is hitting off the tee, then soft toss, then batting practice off the pitching machine. But he says he's confident he's going to be ready on the offensive side. The defensive side is another question in this one. And according to John Denton's piece, Tommy Edmond hasn't even started really throwing yet. That's good for an outfielder. It's great for an outfielder. So this isn't about Tommy Edmond and, you know, if he's going to be ready with this one because, as we all know, the Cardinals and medical sides, like, it is a question mark. But let's go down the hypothetical path that he's not ready, at least on the defensive side. Man, the trickle-down effect of that is massively impactful for this Cardinals team because this is the guy you're relying on to be your cornerstone in the outfield, at least on the defensive side. Tommy Edmond did a very good job for you at the end of the season, although I'm still skeptical. He had the right routes ran, he made the right catches, and he could throw, throw the ball well for you. So you knew he was going to at least be somebody you weren't questioning out there. If he's not available at the beginning of the season, and maybe it's just for a couple of weeks. I, I, I'm assuming you're just pushing Lars Newpar to the center field position. Dylan Carlson gets some reps if he's ready to go, and Brendan Donovan rotates into the outfield as the corner outfielder. Not as concerning if it's a couple of weeks, but, man, if it's a couple of months or if this is something that they're just not confident in, he's back to full health and ready to go that's going to have a trickle-down effect that massively impacts this team defensively. Yeah, if he misses some time or this injury ends up impacting some of his defensive ability or defensive capabilities in center field, which, look, I, I'm a, I don't think that's going to be an issue. I just want to say that on the front end because, first off, he never had a strong arm, and I'm not sure how much Whoa. worse it can really get. That's just a fact. Like, <laughs> let's just be honest. Um, that's my whole big question mark about Tommy Edmund in center field because – you're right. His jump, his uh, closing speed on his routes to help get to balls in the gap was the best on the team. Yeah. So if he had to miss, like, the beginning, like, say, first 10 days of the season, the Cardinals would survive that. But if this injury were to last a little bit longer, like he has a major setback, or if he this actually does end up impacting his defense, the Cardinals are in serious trouble because, as John Denton mentions in his piece, according to FieldingBible.com, Edmund was a plus three in defensive runs saved in center field. The other six Cardinals who played in that position last year were a negative four combined, and that includes Lars Newpark, Dylan Carlson, the two guys that would get reps, who will, will get reps in center this year, whether Edmund's healthy or not, um, just because when he needs days off, I, my guess is Carlson will slide into center over Newpark and they'll keep Newt in a corner. But yeah, th this would have a huge trickle-down effect on the Cardinals because not only would it impact center field per se, let's just let's go through the hypothetical scenario of. Mason Wynn really struggles offensively, and the Cardinals say, you know what, we still think there's more there. He needs to go down to the minor leagues and work on his work on his plate approach. Yeah. Well, you know who plan B is at shortstop this year? It's Tommy Edmond. Yeah. So if, he, if this wrist injury ends up impacting his defense at all and makes him take a step back, and again, I don't think that's going to be the case. Typically, a wrist injury deals more with your um your power 
at the plate, which right. he never had a ton of that. So I, I, I'm not too concerned overall based on what we've heard on what the reports are, and I expect him to be ready for camp, uh, or excuse me, for opening day. But if there was a setback and there, this is more serious than the Cardinals have let on, yeah, it's very concerning because I think he is – I think he's their best all-around defender, if I'm being honest, at multiple positions. So it would have a huge impact on the St. Louis Cardinals. And as much as we talk about offense and the starting pitching needing more swing and miss and the bullpen needed an upgrade this offseason, one of the things that the Cardinals really need to improve this upcoming season, and it comes from internally, is the defense getting back to where it was two years ago. Well, that's center field for you. I mean, that's going to be the biggest – that's going to be the biggest puzzle – into this for the Cardinals like I feel like you have backup plans everywhere like you got a backup plan at third and first base if something does happen to either of those players second base you've got like five guys who can play that position for you catcher you've got a couple of options left field right field you've got pieces that you could plug in there depending on how long the injury is shortstop and catcher or shortstop and center field are those two positions that you look at and you say if something happens, we're in trouble. Now, maybe Dylan Carlson gets back to form. He's not the greatest in center field, but you're comfortable with him if it's short term. Shortstop, you know, maybe you can throw one of these guys that you acquired in the trades at the deadline this past year, but Tommy Edmonds, that backup plan for you. That's what's going to plague the Cardinals, and this is what we've talked about so much. Like, you don't have a fallback if your offense isn't there for you. If your offense isn't there, your fallback's not defense. Your fallback's not pitching your only hope to stay alive is solely pre uh, predicated on that offense being really good. Yeah, and, and I think for the Cardinals, the way they're going to improve defensively this year, and I think that is probably one of the top three things that will be something to keep an eye on the, as the season gets going this year is what does the team defense look like? Mason, when we saw last year, he's got a great glove. In fact, even if he doesn't hit, I, yeah. I think they I may I think he's going to be there no matter what. Yeah, I, I, unless he's hitting like 125, then there's a more of a conversation to be had. But if he can be, a res I don't want to say respectable, but if he's around like that 200 mark, I think they probably just say let's ride with the glove because he's at, an, he's at a, um, a, a, a position in which you need someone that is elite defensively, and he is elite defensively. Gorman, I think his range got better last year. I think he's got a cannon of an arm. I think you're fine there. And then Arnado, if he's healthy, you're going to get a normal Ar Nolan Arnado year. Or you're really going to see the team outfield defense take a improved step this year is Lars Newpars in a corner where he belongs in left field. Jordan Walker takes steps to improve compared to last year when the season started where he was the one of the worst outfielders in all of baseball. And I think you saw A, improvement at the end of the year from Jordan Walker, and B, I expect improvement from him this year. I think he's going to be league average at worst defensively. I think he can be better than that. And then Tommy Evan can win a gold glove in center. I, the Cardinals have said that. I believe that. And it's not going to be because of his arm, but it's because he's going to get to a lot of balls that last year. Dylan Carlson, Lars Newtbar couldn't get to. And that's not because they're not good outfielders. They are, but they're just corner outfielders. And it's a little bit different in center field to where that one misstep in center, if you don't get the right read off the bat right away, it, you have to have closing speed to get to that. And they just didn't have that. And that's what was a difference maker for Harrison Bader in center field yep. to where if he took one bad step, he could make up for it with his speed. And Tommy Emmett can do the same thing. And the uncertainty of Jordan Walker in right field, that's the other position that you're also looking at and you're saying like if that defense doesn't improve then and, you're, I, and I think he will I do too but you're talking about a big hole if it doesn't improve yeah. and Tommy Edmonds not there because I saw somebody saying like Dylan Carlson was great for you in center field I think Dylan Carlson was average for you in center field I think you need somebody who can close out plays faster for this Cardinals team Grant can we get the breaking news sounder ready because we have got some breaking news from the St. Louis Cardinals, oh, no. and I am I am stunned. I hope I don't. This looks like oh, okay. the real St. Louis Cardinals. <laughs> yeah, it is. 101 ESPN breaking news alert. The St. Louis Cardinals have made a signing. We're just about to bring this up. Yesterday they sent James Nail over to Japan. They sent him packing. At least it wasn't on his birthday. I thought, oh, that would have been even better, though. Um, I <laughs> thought for sure they were going to sign a bullpen arm. No, the St. Louis Cardinals are doing a St. Louis Cardinals move and have signed three-time All-Star former St. Louis Cardinal infielder Matt Carpenter to a one-year contract for the 2024 <laughs> season. I, I am, I am... <laughs> I am just stunned. I'm flabbergasted right now. Nothing against Matt Carpenter. Like, it's cool that he's back in St. Louis. This will probably be his final year in Major League Baseball. And he's he, he's essentially back in the Taylor Motter role. But oh. why? Why? You cleared a 40-man roster spot for this? 
I, you know what this screams to me? This screams to me the Cardinals aren't comfortable with the culture in that locker room, and they're trying to replenish what they used to have. You bring in Daniel Descalzo, you sign Lance Lynn, you bring in a Matt Carpenter, Yadier Molina's back. John Mozeliak is trying to, to grasp on to years past when the Cardinals were successful and try and create that same atmosphere and energy in that clubhouse. You need pitching. You need pitching. And this is the move that you're going to add to the 40-man roster after you just cleared space? There was projections of maybe they're going to go sign Phil Maton. Maybe they're going to go after one of this, what was his name, Ryan Bracius, that's available this offseason? Well, we had a, yeah, yeah. I don't even know who he is, but he's, a, he's an arm. But instead, we're bringing back the salsa? <laughs> yes! By, by the I'm way, sorry. so let, let's get into the let, let's get into this because I don't fully understand what his role is going to be. Well, let's do this on the other side. We got ask us anything three one four three nine 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 six four six. Plenty of questions I would assume are coming in about Matt Carpenter as he signs a one year contract uh, to return to the Cardinals this season. Ask us anything comes next here on one hundred and one ESPN.
got questions, we may have the answers. Maybe it's BK and Ferrario's questions and answers on 101 ESPN. 314-399-9646 is our Air Comfort Service text line. Also, our YouTube channel, at 101 ESPN STL, as it is time for Ask Us Anything. And all of the questions are starting to fly in on our Air Comfort Service text line. What the bleep? Matt Carpenter, if you missed it, just signed a one-year contract with the Cardinals for the upcoming season. And this is a major league contract. This isn't an invite to spring training. This isn't a non-roster signing. This is a, you're a part of the roster going into this upcoming season and look before we freak out with it he's 38 37 gonna be 38 years old ages but a number i know but what i'm saying is this is not going to be a big contract this is going to be a i would say close to league minimum a veteran minimum that you're talking about with matt carpenter unless the cardinals found some extra money and said you know what welcome back matt carpenter here's the part that i wonder about t-bone wonders about and we got a text from the 314 Guys, as weird as it is, does this set the Cardinals up for another move? And this is the part that I'm curious about. And T-Bone brought it up in the commercial break. Does this mean you're trading one of your left-handed power bats? Now, I'm not saying Matt Carpenter is a power bat because he hit five home runs last year for the San Diego Padres, 15 home runs two years ago for the New York Yankees, but he's a He's a left-handed hitter that is going to provide some pop for you. That's going to be his sole role with this team. Maybe fills in at first base for you occasionally. If if anything, this is potentially setting you up to try and trade Alec Burleson to see if there's an opportunity to get a starting pitcher. I don't think they'd be this crazy, but does it present the opportunity to trade a Nolan Gorman to get your starting pitcher? That's my tinfoil theory with this is if you're bringing in a left-handed bat that is going to be off of the bench for you you're probably going to be trading away a left-handed bat off of the bench for you because right now you can only carry 13 position players and i think you're pretty jam-packed at that position right now yeah and that's what i'm trying to kind of figure out right now because i i would like here's what i'd like to say I, I'd like to believe that you and I, we're, we're like one and the other. We're thinking the same, along the same lines. They're going to trade a left-handed bat to go get a starter with upside. Maybe that's a Burleson for like a Cabrera from Miami that has upside or to Gorman in a package to go get seats. But what I'm trying to figure out is if that's not the case. What are you doing? Because I So you mentioned 13 players. So we, we, let's all run through the starting nine together. That's what I'm doing right now. So let's Contreras, do- Goldie, Gorman, Wynn, Arnado. That's your infield around uh-huh. the diamond. Newt Edmund Walker is kind of the projected outfield. Uh-huh. And Donnie's gonna, Donovan is going to be a DH, second baseman, something along those lines. Okay. Yeah. So that's the, the nine. Right now, who I would probably say you can put in pen on the opening day um, roster on the bench, Herrera, who will be the backup catcher. Alec Burleson, who will be backup first baseman, I thought, slash fourth or fifth outfielder. And Carlson. Now, if we add Carp to this mix, because he will not have options to go down to the minor leagues. Yeah, I mean, I, I've got 12 I, position players. 13 would be Matt Carpenter. I I don't necessarily understand what, like, how he fits into what and like what his role will be, because I would rather have Burleson as a backup DH or someone that's getting at bats and honestly playing first base over Matt Carpenter. Carpenter can no longer play second base or third base. And, I mean, the Yankees played in the so, outfield because they, they needed to uh, two so, years ago. So here's the position players that I wrote down pre-Carpenter. Edmund Burleson, Carlos, Carlson, Newt Bar, Walker. I've got five outfielders. I've got two catchers, Contreras, Herrera. Yep. And in my infield, Goldie Arenado, Donovan, Gorman, win. That's five guys. So that's 12 players. Carpenter would be 13. So on your 40-man roster, that leaves out Luke and Baker. It leaves out Jose Fermin. It leaves out Buddy Kennedy and Jared Young on the outfield side. Moises Gomez, Michael Ciani, and then that's it. Now, Thomas and JC is not a part of this 40-man roster, so he's not even in the equation right now. So all of those guys I mentioned, sure, fine. Like, for me, doesn't need to be a part of this team, although he was useful when you had no other positions and the injuries popped up. Buddy Kennedy was, wasn't really anything. Jared Young wasn't really anything. I mean, if that's your 13-man roster, then cool, fine. But I've got one guy who can only do one position. 
I've got another guy who can maybe do two positions, but really it's only one in, in uh, Alec Burleson. And I've got one, two, three options of just solely DH, four if you want to throw Gorman or Donovan into this. Yeah, I like they're clogging up the roster once again. But but so like where I would because like I agree with you. I, just, I don't understand what the role is for him. What I would say, though, is I don't think it's clogging the roster because like there's no need to get him at bats. And it, it, he kind of you mentioned this, I think, off air. He kind of serves as the Taylor Motter role. And I think to an extent, based on what I'm seeing right now, Taylor Motter role, I, God's a lot what of I'm looking at opportunities. though. <laughs> yeah. Oh, yeah. <laughs> Hopefully we learned, Ollie. Yeah. Um, but I. I think maybe what they are probably trying to do, and I, I think you said this. I don't know if you said this on air before we went to break, mostly because I was like so flabbergasted yeah. and I forgot how you teased this segment. I wonder, I wonder if they basically are using this last roster spot for the bench and saying, let's just give this to a guy that can be a veteran that'll be good in the locker room, yeah. Matt Carpenter. And they have talked about that a lot. That was a big reason for bringing in a well, Lance Lynn. It's funny you said that because this is the quote in their press release from John Mosellock. Matt showed from the very beginning of his career how hard work and determination can lead to success. And we are excited to have his leadership and experience back in a Cardinals uniform. That's what you signed him for. You signed him so you can have another player with leadership around this group because you're worried they can't do it. Yeah, I, so I, I'm sorry. Like that would be great if your roster was ready to go on a run. And, and look, for those names that you mentioned, like who else is on the 40 man? Well, Carpenter did not have a good year last year for the Padres. And I look to like see like, oh, maybe there's splits that like back this up. He can hit right handed pitching. Uh, don't look at that because he, he can't. You look at who is on the 40 man that can play infields or outfield. Luke and Baker, Jose Fermin, Buddy Kennedy. Jared Young, which I don't remember how they got Jared Young, um, Moises Gomez, Michael Ciani. I don't even. Those are those that. are the guys that are on the forty man that we didn't. We are not currently projecting to make the opening <laughs> roster. Right. I mean, there's definitely a chance that Carpenter could get back to having like a league average year and could be better than all those names that we just said. And if that is the case, and the Cardinals think, you know what, maybe he can do that. And again, you, like you said, this is probably we haven't seen any numbers yet. This is probably a one year league minimum deal yeah. or like my guess one year a million dollar deal like that is this is not a one year 15 million dollar deal if it is you should take pitchforks down to bush stadium <laughs> i i i think it is just all about what you said i think it's all about can he bring veteran presence to our locker room he's not he's going to be in the taylor modern world where he's not going he shouldn't play a lot and if he does have a league average year if he can be like 100 ops plus and provide maybe a little bit of popping and try handed pitching He's better than all those guys that we just said on the 40-man that we're not projecting to be on this roster. Carpenter hit 201 from 2020 to 2023 with the Cardinals, Padres, and Yankees. 47 games with the Yankees. Let's take that out. He hit 176 in the National League since he was 34 years okay. old. You didn't have to bring up that kind of negativity. I'm sorry, but... I mean, you're right. Here's like the thing. I hope this is setting up for another move. I hope that this is them saying... Let's get somebody who can cover the bats for the left-handed pop that we might need at some point, and let's go solidify this roster with a pitcher. I hope that's where they're going with this. But my gut tells me that this is more of a, well, we need leadership on this group, so let's bring back Matt Carpenter, and he can instill that Cardinal way into our roster. We'll find out. Uh, we do have a number on this, according to Ken Rosenthal. It's a one-year deal worth $740,000, yeah. which makes sense. That's kind of what we thought. Perfectly understandable with this one, then. then it's a cheap deal but it's got to be setting up for another roster move for this Cardinals team. We'll keep you posted of more information on this if it happens. Is Katie Wu going to hop on with us, T-Bone? TBD. Yeah, so determined. maybe we'll get Katie Wu on with us. She's probably doing a lot of work right now, but we'll keep you posted if anything else comes out with this Matt Carpenter topic and probably get back into it in the 1 o'clock hour. But coming up next, the Blues have gone into a trend backtracking to what they were with Craig Berube. There was a lot of chatter at the time of, you know, well, maybe the coach is the problem getting these guys going. Well, after these last couple of games and hearing Drew Panister, I think it might be more of a roster issue. We'll discuss that next on 101 ESPN.
alongside Tanner Hendrickson and Grant Francis. I'm Alex Ferrario as we are here at the Centene Community Ice Center, e and Granite Studios. As we'll get back into some Cardinals conversation coming up in just a bit as the Cardinals have brought back Matt Carpenter. But let's jump back into the Blues because we've talked a lot about this Blues team and uh, the focus on them trending in the right direction, fixing the issues after Craig Berube was let go. But we were very cautious with it. And we said, like, you know, it might be a honeymoon phase. And let's get past that honeymoon phase before we start to see if those real issues are there. And I think we're past that now. It's the third straight loss by the Blues, albeit that loss against the Boston Bruins was a good game. You had to come back three separate times, but you did. That was the compete that we've talked about with the Blues. The Philadelphia Flyers game was not pretty. And then, of course, last night against the Washington Capitals, you lose 5-2 to two and you put only 20 shots on goal. So I want to go back before we get into this conversation to play you a cut from Doug Armstrong when Craig Berube was fired and the question was posed to him about being a coaching issue or a player issue. This was Doug Armstrong. It's, it's not something that you want to hear as a manager that – we just didn't prepare to play tonight or we just didn't have it tonight like that's there's there's things in in your career in your job every day in your life every day that you control and preparing to work is one of them and working hard is the other i don't care what you do it for a living when you face people that ask you that question and say yeah just didn't prepare today wasn't wasn't you know just didn't have it today and you say it time and time and time again it gets people's attention it got my attention so remember the quote we played earlier of him talking about he wants to see accountability and compete from the coach now i want to play you two different cuts from drew banister following their last two losses first against the philadelphia flyers um I, you know I, I think we got what we deserved you know for for 40 minutes um uh, we didn't have enough effort in our game uh in the hard areas um, you know, we continue to mismanage the puck, you know, that is, you know, making it difficult on our team to have to defend, which, you know, makes it easy for them to get more offensive zone time, more shots on the net. Um, you know, so, you know, the first two goals, you know, we, we turn the puck over in the offensive zone, it goes down and it's, it's in the back of our net, you know, and, and those plays can't happen you know there's we got to make better decisions there so you heard him talk about execution not ready to execute and ready to compete and then this was last night after the capitals loss i think it's it wasn't really what they were doing i, I just i don't think we were very predictable in getting pucks underneath uh things that we talked about as a group putting pucks to areas that we can get to you know and, and sustaining ozone pressure and, and that's that's something that collectively as a group they they have to decide that they want to do if, if we want to have success moving forward listen to the words that he's using there deciding that they want to do compete execution remember when everybody was whining to us t-bone at the begin or in the middle of that stretch when they were losing to columbus and losing to san jose oh well it's the coach's job to make sure that these guys are ready to compete if it's the coach's job that's ready to make sure these guys are compete then let's start saying the same thing about drew banister you know why i'm not because I think it's a roster issue. I think Doug Armstrong said it to you during that press conference that I needed to get rid of the uh, potential... Last variable. The last variable, thank you. The last variable to decide what the real core problem is with our team. Well, guess what? He got rid of it in a Stanley Cup caliber coach to find out if it's a roster issue. You brought in a coach who got the best out of this team for a 13-game stretch. I can't deny when they go 5-4-1 and one against a lot of first and second place teams. But now you've gone two straight games against opponents where you're in desperation mode to get into the playoffs. And we're talking about execution and we're talking about lack of compete. I hate to say it, but I think it's very clear we can stop with the coaching issue and start with the roster issue. Yeah, I, I think you're right. And I think, and, and look, maybe it's just a two-game low for the Blues, but it's hard to, like, give them that caveat since this is stuff that's been talked about since Baruby was here and now that he's being now that he's gone as well because those quotes that we just played from Drew Bannister if I just sent you like the typed up version of that quote and just said hey who do you think said this Craig Baruby or Drew Bannister yeah, you would have said 
You, you would Who have, knows? You have no idea. Right. You would have been right probably in saying both. Yeah. So I, I think you're right. I think it is a roster issue. Now, I think there are two things that are an issue, and I think w- the first one I'm about to bring up is the most – or I'll say the second one. The second one is more concerning to me. First off, I, I think there is a lack of talent on the roster. I, let's just be frank. They – they don't have enough depth of scoring. Their depth of scoring is not there this year. Defensively, they still the advanced metrics tell you they are basically the same as they were last year. They're not as good defensively. And the reason that they have looked competitive, or at least in the standings look competitive through 43 games, is because Jordan Bennington's been freaking awesome this year, and Joel Hofer has been better than Thomas Grice which wasn't hard to accomplish. And, and, and just side note on that, I'd argue that the defense has improved in terms of the defense men. I think part of the problem that the numbers don't look good against this team are because of the, the lack of puck responsibility on the stick of the forwards. They're putting the defensemen in a bad spot. As Drew Bannister likes to say it, you don't play under the, or you don't play over the puck, which means yeah. if you're skating ahead of the puck, well, you're putting your team in a bad Trying position. Trying to go before it's actually ever Absolutely. out of the zone. And, and look, maybe that's the case. I, I still believe the defensemen have not been all that impressive this year outside of Colton Prego, who's been fantastic in my opinion. Um, but that's a different conversation. So that's the one, the one issue. But the second one, and the one that is most concerning to me, is the lack of compete. Why, why is it that they continue throughout now two coaches this season, have games where they just kind of show up and they just – they don't have their legs, and then they just don't feel like really getting after it tonight because it's not like they were playing in a back-to-back. If that was the second game of a back-to-back last night, going on the road to Washington, having yeah. to travel from St. Louis. Okay, yes, I don't like to use that as an excuse because every team has to do that, but that's more understandable. They had two days off in between going to Washington to go play the Capitals, and then they go out and they had trouble competing three days after having a game in which, as you heard in the cut against Philadelphia, where Drew Bannister said, hey, yeah, we didn't play for the first 40 minutes. Yeah, you had two days off in between. Yeah, that's the kind of thing that I'm not sure how you really solve, and that is where it's going to be a challenge for Doug Armstrong to, at the end of the season, go, okay, let's look at everybody that's on our roster and who can we circle that had a compete issue because yeah. that guy has got to go. Uh, that, and that's what he said in the press conference, essentially. Absolutely. He talked about, look, I'm not afraid to buy players out if I don't feel like the compete is there. And I'm not sitting here to bash on the roster and say like, oh, this team's off. What I'm saying is the the variable that we were talking about as Blues fans for the longest time this season was, you know what, maybe it's Craig Berube. Berube can't get the best out of these types of players. You know, you you can't get the best out of the Kairos because Berube's a, he's a gritty physical head coach, and they need somebody who could come in and coach these guys. Well, you did that. You brought in a Drew Bannister who has been with all of these guys in the American Hockey League, and you did get some of it. But again, I wonder if that's the honeymoon phase, and now you're starting to see those real colors. You're starting to see a compete problem with a roster that you were talking about at the beginning of this season that you were talking about at the end of last season. And the perfect example for me in terms of, you know, well, what do you want to see? What tells you that you got the right roster in place? Look at the Philadelphia Flyers from last year to this year. Philadelphia was selecting in the top six last season. They were talking about a rebuild because their team was in such a bad spot, trying to trade away a Travis Sanheim, trying to trade away a Travis Konechny, looking for an opportunity to restart the page with a new general manager and new president of hockey operations. In one season, with a, the same head coach and with basically the same roster. Now, Kevin Hayes is not there. They did get back a Sean Cordier, who's a really good two-way player for them. But Travis Sanheim is now viewed as a top player in the National Hockey League on the defensive side. Travis Konechny is almost over a point-per-game player, and they're a team that's sitting in a top-three spot in their division. They went from a team that was selecting sixth to a top-three spot in their division in one offseason without making any significant changes. Because if you listen to anybody talk about the Flyers, and I talked with Kevin Kurz, who covers the team uh, for the Athletic a couple of days ago, He said it's buy-in from everybody in that locker room. There's a tightness in that locker room, and John Tortorella has a way that he wants to play, and everybody is bought into it. That's why I go back to a roster issue, because we've seen the roller coaster. We've seen the best of this team that wins the one-goal games, like they did against Vancouver and Dallas and the Rangers, but we've also seen the worst, the 5-1 loss to the Tampa Bay Lightning, the 5-1 loss to the Florida Panthers, last night to the Washington Capitals. Those are all teams that, as Doug Armstrong has said, are teams that are on the same level as you. And if you're not playing competitive hockey against those teams – 
then again, to me, that comes back to maybe we've got a roster problem that doesn't have the right mindset of winning hockey games. Yeah, and I think and I think the breadcrumbs were kind of laid out for this, even going back to like last year at the end of the season. Because at the end of the season, I remember Doug Armstrong saying something along the lines, I can't remember exactly what the quote was, but it was something along the lines of like, you know, a lot, of, a lot of players now want to look at just kind of the highlight reel. You know, if I have my goal that's going to get a 1,000 clicks on YouTube or whatever it is, then that player may think that that's a successful night and it's more about a team game than it is about an individual game. And I think there is still a little bit of that here in this St. Louis Blues group. I think for the most part it's been better, but the compete level is just the biggest thing. And I, I, I don't know how you really got into this spot, if I'm being honest with you, because it is shocking to just see a group, a group effort. It's not one player. That's the part that is so shocking. Is it's not just one guy. It is a yeah, group effort exactly. to where it is. You know, I can understand one guy because there are some guys that kind of go about it that way, and and I could see that. But for a whole group that has some vet, uh, some pretty good veterans on the squad too, by the way, that you look at and you say. Why why can't they just show up on a night in night out basis? And even if they even if they don't have the talent to go out there and be one of the three best teams in the Central Division, at least go out there and just compete. Give everything you've got. See if you can find a way to scrap and claw your way to a victory, as Mike Schilt would love. But I I don't see that from this squad on a night in night out basis. And I think we did there once you got that new coach bump from Drew Bannister. But I think as the last three games have really shown us. It feels like that is wearing off, and you're starting to see them kind of just mold back to them former selves when they were playing under Craig Berube. One more quote from Doug Armstrong that I found interesting. I was just going back through it last night and this morning of that press conference, and he talked about, you know, it's 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 fool's gold. It's a loser's mentality when, yeah, you're getting more shots than the other team at the end of the game, but you're doing it in the third period when you're trailing. The Blues were outshot 19-17 to against the Florida Panthers in the first two periods of that 5-1 loss, and then they tied them in shots 12-12, to which was 31-30 to at the end of the game. The Rangers game, you were being outshot, outshot 27-15, to and you ended at 42-20. to The Bruins game, you were being outshot 22-14 to in the first two periods, and you ended 35-20. to Flyers, 33-18, to and you ended 42-30. to And then last night, 18-15, to and you ended at 26-20. to Sure, you're... you're you're not, I mean, first of all, you're not getting a lot of shots on goal, but sure, you're getting closer at the end of the game, but you're doing it in the third period when you're down by two or three goals. And that right there is back to the compete conversation, and it's back to, look, we could talk about Rod Brindamore. We could talk about Joel Quenville. You can talk about Drew Bannister getting this job at the end of the season, but this all comes down to finding out the way to get the proper mindset from a group of players. And right now, I think Drew Bannister is starting to recognize that that mindset is a lot more difficult to get out of these players than what previously thought. And I, I, and I don't even think this is necessarily on Drew Bannister. As like it, I don't act like it's a shock to him. But I think, I, I think we've heard Joey talk about it when we've interviewed him too, is sometimes it can be hard for coaches to kind of get in touch with these guys right. because they are talking to them uh, like, I'm just going to use Kyra as an example because he's the highest paid player on the team. And I'm not even like trying to single him out in this conversation because I think he's been okay this year. A guy making $8.5 million, it, yeah. it, it's tough to get across to him like, hey, man, you got to go out and you got to do this, 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 and this. You're paid for goal scoring. You got to go in there and you got to win those puck battles. And again, I'm not just singling out Jordan Kyra. I think this can be said about a bunch of other guys as well. Yeah, I mean, but Pavel, I, I bring him up because he's making $8.5 million well, highest on the team. Pavel Buchnevich is making 5.8, and he's got one goal, and it's an empty netter in his last 13 games. So, I mean, like, you could go down the list. Brady exactly. Shen has been struggling, which I think there's a lot on his plate being the captain. Kevin Hayes has been struggling. Brandon Saad's been struggling. Like, there, you could go down the list with this one, and from the 314 says, what's the quickest fix to get this team? Do you trade one of those players? I don't know if it's one player that makes that much of a difference. I think you're talking about a mindset right now that Doug Armstrong's going to have to figure out how to get the best out of this group. He's Tanner Hendrickson, Graham Francis. I'm Alex Ferrario. Coming up next, we found out that the Cardinals have re-signed or brought back Matt Carpenter. Are they clearly trying to take that clubhouse back to the winning mentality of years past? We'll get into that next here on 101 ESPN.
update for everybody. Katie Wu of The Athletic, our Cardinals insider, is going to join us at 1 o'clock today. So make sure you stay tuned for that. Katie's going to join us to talk about the Matt Carpenter signing that took place a uh, less than an hour ago. Cardinals announced he returned. Kevin Rosenthal reporting that it's a one-year, $775,000 veteran league minimum deal. And it's not a, a training in, It's not a spring training invite. It's not a non-roster signing. He is a part of the roster for the Cardinals in the upcoming season. And obviously, the first reaction is, what the hell are the Cardinals doing? Why are they putting yeah. him on a roster That's spot? That's exactly what I said. Understandably so. Look, I'll also say this. like, look, It's a low-risk, low-reward move. Like, Let's say he gets back to form and, and is good for you. Cool, great. If he's bad, you just wave him or you just keep him on the roster and say, like, yeah, he's on the injured but, list for the re rest of the season. Real quick, you mentioned that, and it's funny you mentioned that because I remember talking about Carpenter last go-around when he yeah. was here in St. Louis when he was hitting a uh, – hold on real quick while I look at his numbers. Real quick, when he was Not hitting good. a whopping 169 with a 581 OPS in 130 games, by the way, back in 2021. <laughs> I, I, and he was under that – that contract extension that right. he had signed. And I remember saying at the time, like, man, at some point, don't you have to at least explore the idea of releasing Matt Carpenter, DFAing him, and just cutting bait and moving on? And we said, he's a legacy Cardinal. You, you don't do that. Is that going to be the same? Is that true again this time around? Now that he's back a second stint, where if, like what you said, you though. put him on the injured list, and he's he, going to be a team, a player the whole time. If he struggles. Yeah. And do you? I don't even think they would. You but do it is with, interesting because it's not like a one year, like the Corey Dickerson signing, yeah. for example. I remember what that contract was. But if he had gotten like a one year million dollar deal, never played for the Cardinals before, and it didn't work, they could have just DFA'd him, moved on. It's a farewell tour. You yeah. do the same thing you did with Yadier Molina when he went to Puerto Rico for six months. Like you, you, you put him on the injured list, and when he's back, he's back. What you did with Adam Wainwright when he struggled and he got hurt last year, you put him on the injured list, and he's in the dugout with the team. Like he's going to be. See, those. those those moves, I well, first off, I think you're right all around. I think you're right here. But those moves, it's like okay, if you did, if they did end up DFAing Wayno, first off, it loses the whole lure of two, the chase at 200. But he was making what 17 million dollars. Right. That's a big pay cut. This is not even a million no. bucks if he struggles. But it's very evident, and that leads us to the point here of what they're trying to accomplish. And again, my hope is that there's another move to come, and they're going to trade an Alec Burleson and go get an Alec Manoa or go get a upside starting pitcher that the Cardinals fans can get excited about. But what I actually think is happening here is they're trying to reinvent this Cardinals way that used to be back into the winning culture. Be, be, look, look at the evidence of the offseason. You bring in Daniel Descalzo as the bench coach. Cool. Understandably so. I'm looking forward to Daniel Descalzo around. Maybe he has the same impact that Skip Schumacher had. Lance Lynn has returned. 2011 World Series champion and a bulldog, the sandpaper mentality. But it's a former Cardinal that used to be a part of that winning team. Now you bring back Matt Carpenter. And in John Mosellock's press conference, he talks about that he's got the culture of a winning mindset and leadership, and we're happy to invite him back into the clubhouse. It seems that the Cardinals' offseason has been centered around the Cardinals realize that their leadership isn't up to the level they thought it was, and they need to put people back into position that keeps these players adjusted to the upcoming season. And, you know, I, I actually kind of questioned it during the commercial break, but if you look at the roster and the turnover that took place, Maybe you did get rid of some of the bad attitudes that were around with Jack Flaherty and Tyler O'Neill. Maybe you moved on from some of those mindsets that weren't the winning culture, and you brought in a Sonny Gray, a Kyle Gibson, a Lance Lynn, and you bring back the Matt Carpenter so that everybody stays in check in terms of this is what it takes to be a winning player in this organization. And if that's the case and it makes a significant difference, then by all means, good move by the Cardinals. But to me, it feels like you could have brought him back on a one-day contract and had him retire and say, you're a part of our coaching staff. Well, he may not want to retire, though. That's the other thing. But I, I mean, you're going to come in and what, get 15 at-bats this season? I, he'll get, I mean, he's, I, that's what's interesting is I don't know, like, my guess is he's brought in with the understanding he's not going to get at-bats. And they will actually use him in the way Taylor Motter was supposed to be used last year to where it is, hey, you're probably going to get, like, a game every like once a week maybe twice a week at best and maybe you get a pinch hit at bat if we need to absolutely do it but i i do find it interesting that i remember when ali marmol said at 
the end of the season, I think it was like day 162, where he made a comment along the lines of like, anybody that doesn't want to be a winning player, we've got to get them out of here. We got to get them, we got to clean up the clubhouse culture. And then he tried to walk back that statement at, I think it was uh, win- the winter meetings. Yeah, because you pulled a pin out of the grenade and you yeah. just threw it in the middle of the season. And, and I, I said at the time, I said, well, you can't walk that back. Either the locker room was an actual issue that you need to try and repair, <laughs> or it wasn't, and, and you just go about it your merry way. Yeah. And I think as the side are telling us. I mean, you mentioned it. Descalzo brought back. Molina, I don't think you mentioned him. He's no, brought I forgot back to mention him. into the front office role. Lynn, Gray, uh, they're going to bring kind of that bulldog mentality to the rotation. Carpenter, Descalzo, Molina are going to bring that bulldog mentality to the position player group. It's clear that they felt like the, the clubhouse culture was a, a major issue. And, yeah. and I, I think they're hoping to get back into that kind of winning mindset, as you mentioned. And we'll see if it works. I, I thought, and if I'm being honest with you, I thought the Gray, Lynn, Descalzo moves, bringing those three in, and Descalzo, again, bench coach. But I thought that three would be enough. And they clearly thought, no, we need one more guy that can be brought in here. And Matt Carpenter, who knows the grind. And, and well, two more guys. You struggled. brought Kyle Gibson in to essentially replace what yeah. Adam Wainwright was to your clubhouse. Uh, and though Carpenter has had his struggles – I mean, you still read about the work that he does behind the scenes and yeah. going to drive line. Like, he is putting in the work and trying to get back to a, being a league average player. Essentially, he's another hitting coach, too, because, like, I mean, he works a lot, a, out a lot with Matt Holiday in the offseason, who Nolan Arenado works out with. Like, Matt Holiday is also kind of a hitting coach with this squad, too. Like, he won't be called that. He is not that. But. That's also a part of probably the mindset. Just like Yadier Molina is coming back as a special instructor, he's helping out on the coaching side or the catching side. I would imagine Matt Carpenter is going to be helping on the hitting side also. Yeah, and he'll be a guy that he can. Younger players can go and talk to him. Right. Um, just like younger pitchers can go and talk to. They're not going. What Wayno served is on the pitching staff where you would see young guys come up and talk to him. Um, two years ago, or yeah, two years ago when they had Albert Juan Yepes, what would he do? He was on the hip of Albert Pujols and would talk to him about hitting. Marp, even though not at that all-star level anymore, still a guy that's been around the block, has seen a lot in his career to where a lot of younger guys will be able to go up, talk with him, talk through their swing, and that's where his leadership is going to come through. I, I think these moves have signaled what, how big of an issue was the locker room. I, we don't know from the outside, but I think what the Cardinals are trying to tell you was it was enough of a concern that they had to bring in, what do we got here, five guys, six guys to try and help address it. Yeah, well, and we'll talk again with Katie Wu of The Athletic at 1 o'clock about this. And uh, I mentioned to you, like, look, if you're going to go down this path and you look at Alec Burleson and you say, we're not really sure where he fits into this plan, and now we've got another bat who could be a DH for us, I, I would not be opposed to them exploring to see what you could get for an Alec Burleson. Can you get... Uh, a Cabrera away from the Miami Marlins with an Alec Burleson? Can you get an Alec Manoa away from the Toronto Blue Jays with an Alec Burleson? Hopefully it's somebody that you're looking at upside for this Cardinals team that can add to the pitching staff. And one more uh, nugget from the text line that somebody texted in, 314-399-9646. They said uh, the Cardinals signed... Matt Carpenter for seven hundred and fifty thousand dollars when they couldn't give Tommy Edmond an extra four hundred and fifty thousand in arbitration. Well, now we know where a part of it went. I'm sure Tommy Edmond is very happy about that. Yeah, exactly. It makes sense. He probably loved Mark when he was. He here. is sacrificing his money for a better culture in the clubhouse. I wonder if they use this in the arbitration hearing. Probably. We need a better culture, and you weren't it, so that's why we had to oh, spend your oh, money. Oh, I don't know if they should say that. Well, I'm sorry. Because Edmund, I think, is a pretty good leader. Ah, uh, well, apparently they needed more, and that's why Matt Carpenter is here with this team. We'll talk with Katie Wu of The Athletic. She'll join us at 1 o'clock. We've also got the junk drawer coming up in 15 minutes. But coming up next, we talked about how it could be a roster issue for the Blues. Can that a roster issue be fixed in the short term? And if not... What's the team's accomplishment needed at the trade deadline? We'll discuss next on 101 ESPN.
Alex Ferrario with you to talk about my friend and insurance agent, Tracy Bibb. And that's probably the most important factor in all of this, my friend, Tracy Bibb, because when it comes to her work with my insurance, customer service is at an all-time high. And we've all experienced that with customer service elsewhere, you know, whether it's uh, your insurance agent or if it's a car problem or if it's a home problem. You're calling five different 800 numbers waiting for somebody to answer, to give you an answer, and they don't respond for a good two to three weeks. The so next thing you know, you're waiting for the solution to get solved. Don't deal with that hassle and anxiety with Tracy Bibb because her and her team preach it's not a matter of if something happens, it's when something happens. And when it does, Tracy and her team are there for you. Perfect example, uh, my wife was in a fender bender with the car a couple of months ago. You give Tracy a call on the side of the road. She's there, gets it all taken care of, and no anxiety needed with that one. So give Tracy a call today. She's also going to make sure she saves you money on your car and home insurance, which, of course, is very important as well. Get a free non-committal quote by mentioning my name to Tracy Bibb when you call her. 314-328-4260. That's 314-328-4260. It's no fib. You're always in great hands with the Bibb. Greg Francis here with a Sports Center update brought to you by Saliga Heating and Cooling. Last night, the Blues were in the nation's capital to take on the Capitals, and they ended up falling 5-2, to two, though Nathan Walker had two goals. T.J. Oshie had a hat trick of his own, and that was the difference as the Blues lose by three in Washington, losing their third game in a row now. They'll be back in action tomorrow night as they welcome the Capitals to St. Louis, back-to-back -back games against Washington. Pre-game at 6 o'clock, puck, puck drop at 7 
here on your home for the Blues 101 ESPN. And before that, tomorrow, you'll have Texas and Baylor some college basketball for you. That pregame starting at 1030. I'm Grant Francis. The Sports Center update's been brought to you by Saliga Heating and Cooling, an independent American standard heating and air conditioning dealer. Tanner Hendrickson and Grant Francis. I'm Alex Ferrario. We are here at E&B Granite Studios at the Centene Community Ice Center. Blues just wrapped up practice. We were just talking with Luke Korak of NHL.com and some lineup juggling. Jordan Kyber went, went back up to that top line. Thomas and Buchnevich together. Uh, you also had a third line that was Brandon Saad, Nathan Walker, and Adam Gaudet. As Nathan Walker was the centerman, Oscar Sundquist dipped down to play with Torb. Chenko and Alexandrov, and they kept Shen Hayes together playing with Jake Neighbor. So a little bit of juggling up of the lines, but uh, obviously Drew Bannister is still searching for some offense from this group. And, and Tanner posed this question to me during uh, our show prep this morning about fixing the Blues in the short term. Long term, it makes sense what they're trying to accomplish. You're hoping Jimmy Snuggerud comes in and brings some offense. You're hoping Dalibor Dvorsky provides that. Zachary Bulldog, Zachary Dean. You're seeing what Matt Kessel can provide, but the short term is the part that we get to, and we say, where do you go from here? We had a texter that asked the question as well, saying, what do you do? Do you make a trade to try and get this fixed? Sure, but I'm not sure one trade fixes this. This seems to be a mindset situation. This seems to be a compete situation. And now that we've seen the, or heard the quotes from Doug Armstrong from that press conference and you heard Drew Bannister's post-game press conference, uh, the only fix short-term for the Blues right now, T-Bone, seems to be the players realize that there has to be more compete from start to finish consistently. And if it's not there, they're not winning hockey games. Yeah. And, and I, I think when you look at them kind of in the short term, I, and they're going to have to weed out the inconsistencies in terms of the compete level that, as I said uh, earlier today, you know, I, I think you look at the roster from top to bottom at the end of the year and you go, all right, sir, let's figure out as a staff, Who's a guy that's an issue with this deciding when he wants to play? Because circle him and let's find a way to move on. Now, remember Bennington's comments after Burby got fired and said, if you don't want to be here, just get the hell out. Yeah. Um, and short term, though, because long term, I understand, like you said, I understand what the goal is, where they're trying to develop and where they're trying to kind of like what what the future holds. But what, what I'm talking about in the short term is like, OK, they stated this year that I remember at the very beginning of the year, Armstrong had a press conference before the season started, and someone asked him something along the lines of, like, what's the goal this season? And I remember him saying, you know, I think we can compete for third in the Central Division, and if we can't get that, we can be a wild card team. And I went, okay, you know that. You know, this is a retool. That makes sense. You're not trying to purposely lose. You are taking a little bit of a step back with the roster, but you're still hoping to get into the playoffs, bring in some playoff revenue, stay competitive, get guys playoff experience. My, my question, though, is, okay, now that we've seen that there's a roster issue, you've had to go through a head coach to try and figure that out, what are you doing in the short – like, what are you doing for 24-25? What is, what is the goal? How are you going to alienate, A, guys that don't want to compete, but, B, also look to try and improve upon guys that, in terms of a talent standpoint? Because those their lines, they've got one line right now. They've got one – they've got – one side, they've got a couple of guys defensively that have played better. I don't know if you have a line right now. I think you have guys. I don't think you have a line right now. Because you could say Thomas Buchnevich and Kairou, they were playing well, but that's gone to the wayside. It's why Kairou was away from them the last game, and then they put him back together. Kapanen was playing up there. Jake Neighbors was playing up there. I, I don't know if you have a line that's playing well. I think you have players that are playing well, but not a line. That's fair. That's fair. Uh, because, you, I mean, he did break up that line, and I don't think that was just looking for balance of scoring before yesterday's game when right. he did that. So that's fair. So you've got really two forwards that are playing well in Thomas and Booch. I, I, I don't know what you do in the short term because most of these guys that we're talking about, a lot of the veterans have been kind of underwhelming this year. Chen has had his struggles. He's under contract for another four years after this year at 6.5. 
I don't think they would trade the captain, and even if they wanted to, he's got a no-trade clause, and I don't know if he's tradable right now. Brandon Saad's got two more years after this year. The way he's playing, I'm not sure how tradable he really is at $4.5 million. They, they've got some contracts here on the books that are such a Kevin Hayes 3.5 for the next two years after this season. They've got contracts that I think they could move on from, but I don't know, and I don't know how they're going to add to depth of scoring to where they can make themselves a competitive team, not just – not just in the in the long run, because, again, the plan makes sense in what they're trying to do in the long run, like three years from now. What are you going to do in those years in between? Because this certainly feels more of like a rebuild to me than it does a retool based on what I'm watching on the ice. Well, I mean, Snuggerud's probably going to be on this team next year uh, unless they tell him they want him to go back to college but one I, more year. So to your point there, what, when I think of Snuggerud, because I, I love the idea of what Snuggerud's going to be. I, I'm really high on him as a prospect. But I think of him and I think of a lot of rookies when they come into the league. I mean, there's very few that will come in and immediately just be elite or be great yeah. right away. A lot of them are going to go through like, and I'm not saying Snugs is going to be like Jake Neighbors, but they're going to go through a, like Jake Neighbors' season. I think Jake Neighbors has been pretty good this year in his first full season in the NHL. But you've seen kind of that roller coaster of a season. It's not been consistent, at least in terms of, the point production. I think on the ice as a whole, he's competed every single night, but he's not a guy that comes in and you can go, all right, let's write him in pen for what we think we're going to get from him in his rookie year because rookies go through the ups and downs. You yeah. saw the streak of Jake Neighbors where he scored whatever it was, five goals and like a six-game stretch, and then he goes through a goal drought, but he still plays well, and that's why, like, though, yes, Jimmy Snugger, I think will, and I think you're right, will be on this team next year. I don't really look at him as like, hey, that's a guy that's going to help them next no, season. But he provides offense, which is what they're they're desperate for right now. Like in my eyes, I'm thinking of Jimmy Snugger playing with a Braden Shen. Maybe Braden Shen looks a little bit better because he's got somebody who has that compete and has that ability to score goals. Right now, they're trying to get anything out of them with Kevin Hayes and Jordan Cairo and Jake Neighbors, and it's not working. So to, to, to answer your question, and I think this texter makes a, makes a good point from the 618, if it's just a talent deficiency, then you stand past unless you can land a top pair defenseman. The argument I'd have there is I don't think a top pair defenseman is making a difference. It's it's the offense that you're searching for. But they said it's not a rebuild because you've got a top centerman, you've got a top defenseman, and a top goaltender. You've got to fix the depth. I think the first thing Doug Armstrong is going to have to accomplish is back up what he said. And he said it at the press conference that he's not afraid to buy out players if those players aren't playing to the mode that they need them to. If that's how he truly feels, then at the end of the season when they do their off-season evaluations and they feel like there are certain players who aren't matching the same compete mindset that the Blues have, then back up what you said and buy somebody out. If you can't trade them, you're going to have to buy them out because you need to prove that that's the first step. The next step is making sure you've got the right coach in place that can get the right compete consistently from the players. I mentioned Philadelphia. They've got the right guy. John Tortorella is, at least for now, somebody who can get compete out of those players on a consistent basis. If that's Drew Bannister, and it seems like he puts that accountability into place, then back that up. But once you take care of those two questions... Then I think the depth comes because we were talking about this. Like if you're looking at long ter or short term, next season, Thomas and Shen, and unless they make a trade, Buchnevich, you've got Colton Pareko, you've got your defenseman. You're looking at plugging holes in terms of depth where you're deficient in. Some of that could be the younger players, but more of that is going to have to be shipping guys out that don't have that same mindset and bringing guys in who do have the mindset. The problem is what Doug also said. He's talked around the league. It's not easy to just trade $6.5 million without a no-trade clause. Then add in the no-trade clause and say, now what do we do? And the reason I brought up this question today of what are they going to do in the short term is because I think they still want to be competitive throughout this. If they had said, like, you know what, if they and they may say this next year, I, I don't know because I think if they're going to plug some of those holes that you talk about, you talked about there, it's probably going to be with one-year deals, just bringing a guy kind of on like the captain thing, where maybe not pick him up on waivers, but bringing someone yeah. of the captain type where it is, hey, we'll bring you in on a one-year deal, kind of prove your value across the league, we'll give you a spot because we've got a spot, why not? Let's just see, if we'll take a flyer on somebody. I, the reason I bring it up though is if they want to be competitive still, and I don't even think that's a bad thing. I wonder how they're going to fix it in the short term of, okay, if they still want to be a playoff team, how do you fix it? Because if they kind of look at it and say, you know what, we just are going to take flyers on guys, we're going to go get one-year deals to fill in those depth spots that you just talked about in the lineup, then that signals to me of, 
you know what, they're probably looking at trying to shoot for a top 10 pick for the next year, maybe two. And I don't even necessarily think that's a bad thing either because, as Curbs had mentioned to us on Wednesday, you know, it's not necessarily the worst thing in the world to end up with back-to-back -back top 10 picks no, because not at all. he brought up the Boston Bruins where I think it was 14, 15, 15, 16. Yeah. They end up with Trent Frederick and... Uh, Char Charlie McAvoy. Charlie McAvoy. Their best defenseman and a top two centerman that they've and, got right now. And it basically just restarts the cycle in a couple of years yeah. to where you get back into a winning window of a six, seven-year period. He's Tanner Hendricks and I'm Alex Ferrario. Coming up in about 10 minutes, Katie Wu will join us to talk about the Matt Carpenter signing. But coming up next, we'll dive into the junk tour here on 101 ESPN.
open it up. The Junk Roar with BK and Ferrario. Brought to you by Fenton Bar and Grill. Best trashed wings in Missouri. Dine in. Carry out. Seven days a week. Katie Wu of the Athletic Cardinals Insider is going to join us in about five minutes or so to try and make some sense out of the Matt Carpenter signing. But now T-Bone's got a junk drawer story for us. Yeah, I uh, I pulled kind of a BK last night. I'm not going to lie. Would so you jinx uh, something? You know how BK, BK's brought up this week in last. He just found his keys to his car. Oh, yeah. He lost them. Yeah, we all called him crazy yeah, and dumb because yeah. he lost them. Well, so last night, oh, no. I went and did, I was doing play-by-play and I got home and I, I always bring my phone charger with me, okay? So as I'm getting out of my car and I'm then lugging all my equipment back up to my apartment, I threw my phone charger in the pocket of my coat. Well, I get ready to go to bed and I'm looking for my phone charger and I'm going, well, wait, I know I brought that in. I remember putting it in my coat pocket. So I look around, can't find it. And I go, oh no, did it fall out of my coat pocket? By the way, an inch of snow has fallen at this point. Absolutely. Onto the ground. So I walk outside at about 1.30 in the morning and I walk towards my car I'm, like, trying to look around. It's dark. And I pull the BK, as he mentioned, how he, like, held up a flashlight, was, like, climbing on the hood of his car looking for it. Yeah, like a psychopath. So I'm outside my apartment in the snow while it's snowing still yeah. with my flashlight on my phone. And I'm, like, looking around my car. I put it up. I didn't have the keys with me, so I'm, like, looking in the car. And unlike BK's scenario where he said my neighbors probably thought I was breaking into my car, there happened to be a neighbor walking outside, walking past me, and he stopped and he went, uh, is this is this your car? And I went, yes, this is my car. Don't don't freak out. This is my car. I'm looking for my phone charger. <laughs> I lost my phone charger and I need I'm just trying to find it. Don't don't worry. Uh, this don't is call my car. the cops, please. Don't, don't call. I and so I look around and, and this guy was super nice and he helped me out and we kind of were looking around my car, didn't find it. It happened to like fall out between like the walk from my car to the apartment and it was buried in the snow and I walked past it. But he helped me find it. But it was very awkward when I just heard like someone walking and I kind of paused and went, Oh, I hope they don't think anything about this and then he asked me the question of uh can i help you sir oh. and it was like oh this is really awkward hey first of all props to that guy for calling you out because if you were somebody trying to break in like that guy's got cojones to call you out yeah. and say something uh second of all the bk move would have been you doing that and then realizing your phone was plugged into the charger the whole time in your room true because that would have been the bk move as we know bk's keys we're under a piece of mail. Because he just was like, nah, I won't shake these keep me this yeah. mail out to yeah. find and, my actual keys. And I was, like, freaking out because this is the only phone charger I, I have. I was going to say, props to you for <laughs> finding that in the uh, snow. And, and, and it fell in the snow, and it was kind of buried. And I'm so glad that this guy found it because I walked completely past it. And at this point, like, I'm here with a stranger. <laughs> And to be honest, I don't know what his act like. I don't know if he actually lives at the apartment complex either. It's just a random guy walking in the area that's going to quote helping me out, you know. So like I'm trying to end this conversation as quick as possible. He's like he he says to me, he goes, "Oh, well, what direction did you walk?" And I'm like, "Uh, do I tell him or?" <laughs> well, my room's right over here. Why don't you come on yeah. follow with me? I'll give you some hot dogs. And he found it super nice guy, and I'm I'm thankful that he was out there to help me. But it was a very uncomfortable and awkward situation last night while I was digging through snow trying to find my phone charger. Yeah, I would have called the cops on you because I like to call the cops and be the buzzkill. He's Tanner Hendricks, and I'm Alex Ferrario. Katie Wu of The Athletic, Cardinals Insider, talks Matt Carpenter signing with us next on 101 ESPN. Hey, it's BK, and I got to tell you about my friends over at Victory Men's Health. It is time. It is time, man, to go over to VictoryMensHealth.com.
Alongside Tanner Hendrickson and Graham Francis, I'm Alex Ferrario as the... We are live here at the EMB Granite Studios here at Centene Community Ice Center, and we head to our 101 ESPN guest line out to welcome in our favorite Cardinals insider. She is Katie Wu of The Athletic. And Katie, let me take you back to about 13 hours ago when uh, you tweeted out that the Cardinals released James Nail uh, and said that that clears a open spot on the 40-man roster. And then fast forward 13 hours later, did you expect the former Cardinal Matt Carpenter to to fill that 40-man roster spot. Oh, man, guys, talk about a Friday news dump. Am I right? Um, <laughs> yes. <laughs> it, it was. Um, it seemed to be pretty obvious the Cardinals had a move coming. The James Nail move had been in work in progress over the last week, obviously in a different time zone with Nail heading to Korea. Um, those kinds of things like medicals and logistics take a little bit. So when that news was official Thursday night, you know, kind of the writing on the wall. You don't clear a 40-man roster spot unless you know who's going to take it. Um, yeah, I, the Matt Carpenter deal is, I think, uh, something not a lot of people expected. Um, certainly by the looks of my, my Twitter mentions and my emails as of late. I'm sure you guys are the same with that text line. But look, I think once we get over the initial shock, I mean, I don't know about you guys, but I had to check my email a couple times just to make sure I was reading the name correctly because it just really – wasn't on anyone's radar at all. Um, I do think that there are a lot of things to break down with this signing, though, and um, clearly a lot of questions, so, so let's get into it. Yeah, Katie, I, I thought I fell for a fake tweet, like a fake Cardinals Twitter account. That's what I, my first reaction was when I saw it. But I, I'm trying to understand, what what do you think that they're expecting his role to be? Because they have a couple of left-handed bats already in Alec Burleson and Brendan Donovan. What, what do you think they're hoping that his role is going to be on this team? All right, let's talk about it, because I, I know when, when you get see a name like Matt Carpenter and you think of the tenure he spent in St. Louis when he was a starter, you know, a really respected player, you're thinking there's no way the Cardinals brought him back to start and be a position player again, and that is correct. Matt Carpenter will serve primarily as a bench bat platoon type player. He signed for a major league minimum $740,000. This is not a, a locked-in contract where he's going to be playing every day. He, again, will be a bench guy. And, and the main reason the Cardinals brought him in is a theme that we've talked about all off season. It's about the veteran leadership. And when you look at those young guys like Jordan Walker, Mason Lynn, Brendan Donovan, Nolan Gorman, I can go on and on. You know, I think those are all very, very capable players. But good teams have players that have won before. And the Cardinals are facing a significant amount of pressure, as you all know, to win and to win right out of the gate. So when you bring in Carpenter on this very minimal impact financial deal um, for a guy that wanted to return and wanted to come back to St. Louis and was comfortable taking a bench role, I can certainly understand why that would work, especially from a leadership perspective. There has been a lot of internal admittance that maybe last year the Cardinals were a little bit overly reliant on their young talent. And this is not to suggest their young talent is not capable. This is not to suggest the young players are the reason the Cardinals lost 91 games last year. I have no way am, am I suggesting that. But I do think in their self-evaluations last year, Cardinals front office and Cardinals coaching staff looked at their clubhouse and said, we need more experience here. And that was something I heard from many of the players as well. It would help to have some leadership and some veteran experience. So that is the role Matt Carpenter will bring to St. Louis this year. Uh I guess the part that confuses me, Katie, is like I look at the team and I think they 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 pursued that leadership. They brought in Lance Lynn and Kyle Gibson and Sonny Gray, and you know they they have Nolan Arenado and Paul Goldschmidt and Wilson Contreras. It seems they already had a ton of leadership. Did it feel like they needed more? Yeah, that's fair. And when we talk about veteran leadership over the offseason, the additions all came from the rotation. And that made sense because you saw how young the rotation was, especially in the second half of the season. Um, what, this is not to discredit the leadership abilities of any of those three guys. Um, but Paul Goldschmidt can't do everything by himself. And he's not necessarily a go out there and go get him leader. He's a leader by example. Right. Nolan leads by how he plays. Wilson had only spent a year in the organization. So while he can tell you and show how to play, it's not like he's had that, that long status in the organization. He was the new guy. And you are a little bit limited when you are in your first new season. Uh, Nolan talked about it in 2021, how he felt like he couldn't really lead the way that he wanted to because he was new. Matt Carpenter 
sure, will be the, the new guy by definition. But when you think about Cardinals, who really exemplified what it means to play Cardinal baseball, a sentiment that both John Mazalock and Ollie Marmel have expressed a desire to return to in 2024, to me, he's one of the top five players that exemplifies that. So it's not necessarily a knock of leadership against the Goldschmidt's, Arenado's, Contreras's of the world, um, but there's a difference sometimes between having veteran experience and better in leadership, and through and through, no matter where he's went, especially in the last three years, I think Carpenter has been about as good of an example as you can get in that regard. And one more on the leadership, Katie, and then we'll go to the other side of it because I know there's there's a lot of people speculating that you know maybe this could lead to a trade for the Cardinals. But with Matt Carpenter himself, I've seen a lot of reaction to like Matt Carpenter's coming in as a bench player. How does that react, or how does that fall into the leadership note? But the other factor into it too is it's taking up that 13th man roster spot for this Cardinals team because when you look through all of the other players, it's hard for me to find another spot that I would say like. Oh, yeah, that's the open availability. It seemed they had one, and Matt Carpenter fills it. Yeah, I agree. And when you're looking at the lefty bats, you have Nolan Gorman, Donovan, you know, that goes on and on, Burleson. And I think there will be some healthy competition there. But, look, when, when you're looking at where Carpenter fits, again, he's not necessarily blocking anyone. Will he create some competition for, for Burleson? Absolutely. But the Cardinals really want to avoid making the same, the same mistakes they did last year, which was not supplementing their young players, their future of the club, with the amount of veteran success that they needed. Putting all those guys in the position that they were in 2023 was really tough. And you think about it, when you have a bunch of guys who have never really lost before and you have a season like April of 2023, no one really knew how to respond to that. Everyone was kind of scrambling. I think Goldschmidt did the best that he could, but he is not him and Adam Wainwright, who was hurt at the time, can't necessarily stop that snowball effect of what was a, a really horrible April. So having someone that can come in there and kind of right the ship if things do go wrong, because guys, we're, we're all aware of this, as are the fans, the Cardinals need to get off to a good start in April. That, that to me, makes sense. So I hear the, the argument, you know, that there wasn't really a place for him, that maybe he's blocking a young player, um, but, you know, spring training is always going to be a competition, and the Cardinals, if, if we've been paying attention over the last three months, have stressed two things, and it's been pitching and leadership. And, Katie, just hearing you talk about it and his leadership in the lefty bats, uh, I'm assuming you don't think that this is a kind of move that is like part two of a three-part move where they send Nail out, bring in Carpenter, and then they look to maybe trade one of their lefty bats, whether it be Burleson or Gorman, to go bring in another starting pitcher. Am I reading that right? I mean, you could never say never. I certainly haven't heard that, but I think with, with the offseason the Cardinals have had, I'm not surprised at anything anymore. Um, we, well, I, it's no surprise to me that, that we're still talking about pitching just when you, when you look at the rotation and, and you look at the five established starters the Cardinals have. You know, they have five guys that they trust to go out there and take the ball every day, and they have some young guys, you know, like the Zach Thompsons, the Matthew Libertors, that are maybe those 4A kind of starters, but – when do the all five starting pitchers make all 32 starts for a club, right? So it wouldn't hurt to have some insurance there. I wouldn't rule it out, but I haven't heard anything along those lines specifically. You guys, I'm still rambling or trying to get my head around how this Matt Carpenter deal works. Uh, you should see my phone. You should see my notes right now. I can't even read my own handwriting. Uh, Katie, I, Mo would mention at winter warm-up that they were going to get they were still looking to add somebody to the bullpen, and I don't think Carp's that guy. So, what? Uh, yeah, I don't think he'll be a, on the mound this year coming out of the pen. Do you do you think they're still looking for another bullpen arm even after this Carpenter deal? Yes, yes, I do. Um, and we talked a lot about the bullpen and how it's been strategically put together at winter warmup. And I asked Ollie this: uh, if it would be fair to say the Cardinals are targeting kind of fluid and flexible guys that can take the ball at any given time whenever asked. And with the exception of Brian Helsley, who is, you know, for more or less their established closer, you look at guys like Giovanni Gallegos, who takes the ball really whenever asked. You look at Andrew Kittredge, who throughout his career has taken the ball whenever asked. He's opened before. Nick Robertson, same thing. And the Cardinals are trying really to put together a very fluid bullpen where guys can go whenever needed. Their hope is to get, you know, at least – five to six innings from their starters each day and kind of bridge the bullpen from there. So if I'm looking at potential bullpen targets, I'm looking kind of that, that narrative, that mold, who could fit there. 
um, say this about the Cardinals. They've kept most of their offseason additions pretty under the wire. So just because you don't hear them linked to anyone doesn't mean they're not looking. I would be pretty surprised if we report to Jupiter in less than a month from today and there is not one more believer on that staff. Katie, we appreciate you doing this on such short notice to where you're trying to wrap your head around it like all of us are. Uh, But as always, phenomenal breakdown. People can follow Katie on Twitter. You can also check out her work over at The Athletic. Katie, again, appreciate the time. Have a great weekend. You got it, guys. We'll talk soon. There you go. Katie Wu of The Athletic, at Katie J. Wu on Twitter. So a couple of things that I wrote down there. Uh, First of all, her saying that, you know, yeah, there always could be another move, but she's not hearing anything. Uh, That seems to be the case with John Mosaylock, where you really don't hear a whole lot until the move is made. Uh, But she talked about, you know, this is a leadership addition, which is something that we kind of talked about once it was signed. Um, She also talked about Nolan Arenado and Paul Goldschmidt, and I saw a lot of response saying that her answer was BS because Goldie and Arenado are leaders. Katie wasn't saying they're not leaders. They're not the same type of leader as Matt Carpenter. Arenado is a do as I say, not as I, or do as I do, not as I say, which I don't even think is a statement. I'm just making it up myself. He's a follow the way that I approach the game with what I do. He's not going to get in your face after a game. Paul Goldschmidt is not going to get in your face after a game. You're going to try and do with him like Ryan O'Reilly was in St. Louis. That's the type of leader she's saying Paul Goldschmidt and Nolan Arenado are. If you believe it, you don't believe it, whatever it might be. Matt Carpenter is the type of leader that a Yadier Molina was or that a Adam Wainwright was that is going to actually say something to you if you're not approaching the game the right way. So that's at least how she's going about this one. And she said that he's also not keeping anybody out of roster spots. There could be internal competition at spring training. The part that I would push back on that one is you were so excited and they're so excited about Thomas to JC. And now I'm not really sure a Thomas to JC fits into a role unless an injury pops up compared to now with Matt Carpenter being on the roster. So those are at least some of my takeaways with Katie. Yeah. And, and that, that last point there real quick, I, I agree with what she said. He's not taking away an opportunity. We've kind of ran through the guys and, so JC was probably going to need a great spring training because he's not even on the 40-man right now to even have any sort of shot. So I, I wasn't too worried about that. But, like, you look at the guys that we ran through, like an outfielder that I didn't even recognize the name of, Young that I, they got, I think, in a waiver pickup or a small deal that was on the 40-man, Luke and Baker, like Jose for me. They're not blocking anybody of, like, hey, that guy really needed to be on the roster. I think there's a chance Carpenter could be better than most of those other names on the 40-man that weren't clear-cut. They're going to take the last... 13 man spot of the position players the thing that i really what she said that i didn't think much about it but and it ties into leadership she mentioned mentioned the horrible april that they had this year where they got off to such a slow start and i think she's what she said was right on of you know they kind of looked around and said man we've none of us in this locker room including arnado and goldie have been through such a bad april on teams that are like with expectations arnado had been on bad teams in colorado goldie had been on bad teams in arizona But when you have a bad month, that's kind of expected. When you're a team that's expected to win the NL Central like the Cardinals were last year, and you get off to that awful start in April, there was a lot of, and you could tell in the players' voices when we heard them early on in the season of, what what the heck just happened and how do we recover from that? And the reason that the Carpenter deal, when she mentioned Carpenter, remember Carpenter was on this team back in 2021 when they had that awful June where it was brutal to watch Cardinals baseball, and they needed that incredible 22-7 and September to get back into the playoff race. And even though he wasn't a contributor on that team offensively, Matt Carpenter was, he was still a vocal presence on that team as a leadership guy. And I think when, when she brought up that part about the horrible April and those guys looked around and were like, what do we do now? We're not used to this. Hey, Carpenter's been through a month like like their April when he was here in St. Louis. Yeah, but the hard part with that is, like, Goldschmidt and Arenado were a part of that team when they had to have that June comeback. You know, like, they were a part of that team. Dylan Carlson was on that team. Uh, Yadier Molina was on that team. Matt, I mean, yes, Matt Carpenter was a part of the problem. But, again, but to what you said, though, Goldie and Arenado aren't those vocal leaders. They, uh, the, well, they... But, see, that's, that's what I would say is more of the problem here. Like, if... It, it, you can't sign one player who's maybe going to take a total of 10 at-bats in April, maybe 10 at-bats in April, to try and help you out of a bad losing skid. Like, to me, that just means what? you don't have winning roster. And, and yeah. one guy's not going to make – if Matt Carpenter is the guy you have to sign that can get in Arenado's face and say, we need you to be better in the bad month that we're having, 
well, then your team is in a bad, bad spot. Well, look, I, I'm one of those to, like, I can understand what the Cardinals are trying to do with this leadership signing. That's what this is, a leadership signing of Carpenter. I understand exactly but, what they're doing, but it's not going to work. But, I, but I'm one of those that is kind of the – I don't listen so much to the, oh, well, leadership is a big issue and this is why we're struggling. Why were the Cardinals bad last year? Didn't have the talent. Didn't have pitching talent. But aren't we why were the, the Blues same thing bad the last Blues? year? I know, and I still – I always say that the leadership is not an issue for the Blues. The issue for the Blues is they don't have talent. Yeah, but we just spent time talking about it today saying that it's a mindset with this team. They don't have a winning mindset. Yeah, and I don't I think there's a leader. Like, Shen, I think Braden Chen is a fantastic leader. If we're going to go on the, the idea of, well, then they don't have leadership in the in the locker room for the St. Louis Blues, well, that's basically saying Chen's not a good leader. And I don't well, think that's true. But I think it's the same thing right now. Like, with Goldie Arenado saying, like, we need to bring somebody in who knows how to get through those trials and tribulations, Goldie and Arenado were a part of those trials and tribulations and found a way through it. Braden Chen, for people that say that the Blues have a leadership problem, Braden Chen was a part of a team that went from worst to first in 2019. I, I think the part that confuses me with this is looking at it, and again, I understand what the Cardinals are doing. The Cardinals' mindset is, well, we need a veteran president in this locker room to get all of these younger players in the right mindset. My issue with it is I think this speaks more to the players that they have in place that says, man, we're not sure if they're the leaders that we need right now, then it speaks to Matt Carpenter providing a presence that, that they're desperate for. Or, and I think it could also say here as well to where that locker room was an absolute disaster last year. And we look at it and go, well, did they really move a lot of guys last year? What happened? Like, they only lost O'Neill and Flaherty, who we think could possibly be those guys. And if you want to view that as a negative against Goldie or Naranato, I, I somewhat understand that because they were there and they're viewed as the leaders of this team. But, again, I, as we've mentioned, this is a leadership signing. And with all the leadership guys that they've brought in this offseason, it tells you that they, they definitely felt that the locker room was a major issue in terms of the – the leadership that was inside there. I'll say it again, just like we said it when it first happened. This feels an awful lot like John Mosaic at his wits end, and he doesn't know what to do with this roster. And he says, well, let's just see if we can reinvent what we had back in 2011, 2013. And you're bringing all of these people back to try and instill that in this clubhouse. And again, maybe it works. Maybe Matt Carpenter is the secret salsa to this team of finding that winning mindset. But it, it it's just such a weird situation unless there's something else coming that's the part that i kind of always fall back and, to and that, to, to what katie said i mean katie said she hasn't heard any, anything and yeah. again they could surprise us absolutely i just i don't see that happening because i don't understand why like burleson is going to provide more for the team than what yeah. carver could in his role and i don't know if they want to bring in somebody like a cabrera who would be who they would get for him probably who walks the world and yes has the upside of a two but he is still needing a lot of grooming before he's ready for that yeah. role. And uh, real quick, uh, this comes from Jeff Jones. John Mozeliak will meet with the That's media via Zoom say. in 10 minutes. So we'll see so what he has to say. Well, we'll see if we can carry that live, uh, John Mozeliak's media availability uh, at one thirty. So let's take a break. We'll come back and kind of reset things here on BK and Ferrario on 101 ESPN.
Grant Francis earlier. Grant Francis here with a Sports Center update driven by Johnny Londoff Chevrolet and Johnny Londoff Autoplex. Earlier today, the Cardinals signed Matt Carpenter back to a one-year contract. That's the breaking news of the day. We're going to hear from John Moselak live in his Zoom meeting coming up next here on BK and Ferrario. I'm Grant Francis. The Sports Center update's been driven by Johnny Londoff. Find your roads and shop 24-7 at Londoff.com and LondoffAutoplex.com. Are you kidding me? Here on BK and Ferrario, live from the ENB Granite Studios at Centene Community Ice Center, alongside Tanner Hendrickson and Graham Francis. I'm Alex Ferrario. Okay, so we are going to be hearing from President of Baseball Operations John Mozeliak momentarily. Uh, he's got a media Zoom availability following the Matt Carpenter signing, uh, so uh, he is going to be speaking with the media shortly to give a little bit more information on that. So we will be carrying that one live. Uh, we are going to scrap one's got to go. I know it's a Friday staple that everybody loves, but I feel like John Mozeliak's a little bit more in impactful with this one and t-bone as we uh, await john mosaic's availability when he starts to speak what are you expecting come uh, from the president of baseball operations well i bet he opens with leadership will be probably a part of the main opening course <laughs> you don't here, think he's but... gonna open with oh no we're making a move yeah I, i'll be curious to know what he i'm sure he'll be asked i'll be curious to know what he says is going to be the role for matt carpenter yeah. if there is any more outside of um, outside of just the leadership aspect of this in the locker room. And he may, I'm sure he'll be asked too, potentially, and now he'll try and probably keep it open-ended about if this has anything to do with like another move coming, as you just mentioned. He would be very less candid about that, though. All right, so I think John Mozeliak is about ready to start speaking with the media. Again, the president of baseball operations on the Matt Carpenter signing. Let's send it over to that uh, media Zoom availability. So I think we're good to go, Mo. Okay, so, um, you know, obviously I figured rather than try to text and email everybody individually, I thought it'd just be easier to jump on the Zoom. So hopefully you guys are okay with that. Um, you know, uh, we're excited. Um, Matt Carpenter was someone that uh, we were always fond of when he was here. And, you know, as we were looking at our club right now, we definitely wanted to try to find somebody with some experience who's been through some things and, um, you know, was speaking with Ollie and, and his group, we thought this would be a pretty good fit. So when he got released, it's been something that we've been talking about. And then, you know, Matt was, uh, this was right before the holidays, but just wanted to get through the holidays and, and ultimately decide if, uh, where he wanted to play. And, um, and so, yeah, so here we are and, uh, definitely take a few questions. Unless no one has any. Hey, Mo, can you speak to like the, I guess, the thought process of adding a guy who's got that seasoning versus I think in a lot of times it's like, well, the young guys can just do that, but they're hoping to be everyday players and and maybe don't have the experience that a guy like Matt can can walk into. Just your thoughts on that role, because it's something that you guys haven't really had. Well, like you had it with Albert and it worked out better than could have been expected. But um, what has the thinking on that changed of needing someone like that? Well, I do feel like, you know, referencing the 2023 season again, and you guys have heard me probably talk in nausea about last year, um, and, and I would agree, I probably have, um, that, you know, we were missing some voices in that clubhouse. And, you know, I, I definitely feel like somebody like a Matt Carpenter who, A, understands the St. Louis Cardinals and how we do things, uh, B, understands where he is in his own career and understanding the type of role he'll have, Look, he's going to come into camp and he wants to compete for at bats. So let's let's not like sugarcoat this, but he also understands that he's not where he once was and and so his contribution can be more of a twofold part of that where he can bring in some veteran leadership to the club, but you know, he certainly still wants to have some impact on this team as a player. Mo, the word is that he's been working out with Matt Holiday. He had he had uh, success with him before. Have you heard anything from Matt or or Carp about you know those some all season workouts? Yes, yes, and yes. Um, that's that was part of what we had interest in, and that's something that we wanted to learn from. Um, obviously, when when 
players are working out, you can get some hearsay and you can ask people like, hey, what'd you see and that kind of thing. But, you know, we were also able to look at some some hard data and got the sense of, of you know, is he getting his back, back, bat speed back and is he showing the ability to, to increase his exit velocity? And, and both of those uh, looked like they were trending in the right direction. And, you know, the one gift Matt Carpenter has is he knows how to to see a baseball and he can still take a walk. And so that's a still a, a great skill. But, um, you know, we are encouraged where his swing is right now. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Uh, Katie, oh. are we going in order? Well, it's in order for me. Yeah, I can I can go. Yeah, thanks, Katie. OK, yeah, no problem. Mo, we talked a lot over winter warm-up about the the theme of returning to Cardinal baseball. And obviously, Matt's 10 years here in St. Louis pretty much embodied that. But I was wondering the difference between veteran experience and veteran leadership that you saw with Carp and why that was that made such a good fit to bring him back. Well, when you look at our everyday club and you have Paul Goldschmidt and Nolan Arnato, and, and you know, again, referencing back, back to the Pujols Molina comments earlier. I, I feel like last year, those two guys were kind of left with having to, to pick up a lion's share of this. Um, well, they were. And just having that being able to spread out was something that I think was important. And so, you know, as we were looking at who this type of person could be, you know, Carp understands exactly the cardinal way of doing things and and what he was brought up with but he also understands you know the group of players we have and because he's not that far removed and so i think from you know looking at our veteran presence on our team now i think he'll just be a a great addition to that group from a, a leadership standpoint thanks thank you all right jeff Mo, from a, a roster construction perspective, can you speak to how you view a 26-man roster that has a spot for both Carp and Alec Burleson, for instance? And, and are you all comfortable with Carp defensively at spots other than first at this point in his career? Yeah, so a couple of things. I do think the the 26-man actually just gives you that flexibility. Um, you know, I've spent almost all of my career dealing with a 25-man roster, so um, I think this is just a uh, an added benefit. And and yeah, I could I could see a, a scenario where they're both on this club. And and in Carp's case, I think he you know gives us flexibility. But you know, I think a lot of this roster has a, a lot of internal flexibility as well. So. Um, you know, ultimately, he probably should show up with multiple gloves, but how we really utilize that will come down to how we're mixing and matching in general. Did any part of, of when you all looked at a roster spot for Carpenter, was there any consideration of, of the health of some of the existing infielders? Tommy obviously is a little bit behind Donovan's coming off an injury. Was any part of that part of the conversation or the discussion around Carp? Not really, no. Um I had been in discussion with Carp since uh, the day after, or no, the day he got released by Atlanta. So this has been ongoing. And um, some of the things you just mentioned are things we just learned about recently. So, you know, ultimately, I'm, I'm still pretty bullish on guys being healthy and ready to go in camp. But, uh, you know, I really feel this is more of just having some more of a veteran voice on our club. Lynn? Hey, Mo, you, you referenced uh, Carp knowing or understanding the type of role he's going to have. I wondered how or if you feel like his understanding of that role um, that he's suited for has changed since the last time he was with you guys and, you know, at the end of the 21 season, or if it's just really more a factor of where you guys are at with your roster in terms of him being part of this club now. No, I think he understands where he is personally um, in his career and, you know, when you think back to to his last year here, he was still hoping to play every day. Now, he also would tell you that if I'm performing well, I hope I get opportunities. And so um, I think that's a fair ask, and uh, we'll see how things play out over the course of the season. But, you know, I, I do think he just, you know, continues to add more flexibility for us. And then if I could just one follow-up, I, you, you alluded to it a little bit just the, with the um... – in the response about some of the work he'd done with with Holiday, but just at this point, what is your sense of the how much of a contribution or what type of contribution you can expect from him at this point in his career? I mean, obviously he had some good numbers. I know with uh, with New York the last year, I think there were times, but overall the numbers were obviously down. What's your understanding or your expectation for what he can give you guys? 
Uh, expectations are definitely higher than how we performed in 2023. I think, uh, you know, there was a lot of things that were going on for him in that environment where I think, you know, getting him out of there and putting him in here, he can benefit from. And, and so um, you couple that with what we're seeing from what he is doing um, when he's in the cage and, and how that looks, you know, we're encouraged. So I think, though, both parties understand he's not where he was five, six years ago when he was looking for an everyday role. Brendan? Mo, knowing Carp and the experience you've had with him and the kind of group of young players, position players that you guys have on your roster, are there specific things about, I guess, the way he goes about his business that you'd hope to see those young guys glean from Carp or, or kind of what was that thought process? Um, you know, I, I think part of it is leadership by example, but I also think part of it is is the ability to speak up when you see something. Um, you know, last year, I think a lot of that was was falling on you know Goldie a lot, and I just think that's a that's pretty demanding. So I I feel like just you know from a clubhouse standpoint, it's just nice to have someone that that understands expectations and isn't afraid to uh, share their opinion on it. From Cardinals President of Baseball Operations, John Mosaloc, speaking with the media following uh, Matt Carpenter one-year contract that uh, he received earlier today. So, John Mosaloc, Cardinals President of Baseball Operations, speaking with the media. Is there any part of you that that wants to see this, you know, come come full circle and him retire as a Cardinal? Sure. Um, you know, obviously uh, he's going to be playing for us, and um, you know, I I can't predict what. The world's going to look like in 2025 but you know we'll see mm -hmm. but obviously he had a, he had a pretty robust career when he was with us prior to thank you Je jeffrey yeah mo when you when you all sort of look at the way that leadership is a part of this decision and, and kind of how carp can help with that was that feedback that you received from nolan and or goldie at the end of last year was there perhaps some discussion from them about how much of that they felt like they were obligated to take on last season? Yeah, so my relationship with those guys is always to, you know, understand what they're thinking, what they're hearing, and and so that was part of it. Also talking with Ollie um, was part of that. And, um, you know, when you have people that are advocating for you to be on this club, that's helpful. And I, I do think um, a lot of, of what they were telling me makes a lot of sense in, in trying to address it. So. Um, you know, I'm hoping it works and I'm hoping he can be successful both in the clubhouse and on the field. Brian? Mo, well, um, last weekend, James Nail was at winter warm up and he was excited about the year. Obviously, you know, a move like that doesn't happen overnight. Can you kind of explain how that works since he's a, I, I guess his 40 man spot would be the one that would go to uh, Matt Carpenter? Exactly. Um, yeah, so the process of that was we we had been in discussion with uh, the South Korean team for at least two weeks, and they had identified a couple different players that they had interest in, James for us, and then uh, players I don't know with other organizations. But when when we finally got to a point where they wanted to do physicals and that type of thing. So we did that on uh, Sunday of the warm up, but um, they they actually wanted to physically read the the MRIs. And so it's not like you can just overnight them like I can to your house. Um, so there was a little bit of a delay in that process, but um, obviously late last night we had confirmed terms and they uh, signed off on the physical. But yeah, so it's, it's it had been going on a while. Thank you. Daniel? Uh, Mo, with uh, Carp filling out that last 40 man spot, <clears throat> do you envision this being the 40 man group that opens camp when there's the first full squad workout? That's a clever way of asking me if we're done or not. Um, and the answer is I don't know. Um, I, I, I still think there's some things that we are looking at and, and trying to pursue. So we'll see where that goes. Thank you. Yes, sir. Lynn? Uh, yeah, Mo, I wanted to uh, just make sure whether or not I um, was hearing or understanding correctly. When you mentioned um, sort of uh, players advocating for um, addition, was that just veteran addition or was that specifically CARP? Um, it was a veteran addition, but with a CARP type of, of mindset and 
experience. Thank you. You're welcome. Randy Carricker, you should probably go on mute. Otherwise, we're all going to have to listen to you drive. Oh, oh, you got that. Thank you. It's the least I can Thank do for the that. group. Yeah. <laughs> Team player. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Anyone else? Yeah, Mo, just kind of maybe to echo on Daniel's point, you were pretty adamant that pitching was still um, something you guys were looking at bullpen-wise at winter warm-up. Is that still in a holding pattern as, as of now? Yeah, I'm paying attention to the market, and uh, that's why I can't speak in absolutes at this point. Thanks. You're welcome. Hey, Brian Marto, I think we can wrap this up. All right. Well, thanks, Mo. And uh... all right, there you go. John Mosella, Cardinals president of baseball operations, uh, his media availability with the Matt Carpenter signing. Um, so just a couple of things uh, to take away from this one. Uh, Mo saying that, you know, Matt understands his role with this team, that he's going to come into camp and he's going to compete for at bats. Uh, but he understands that he's also coming in as a veteran presence that might not see the field an awful lot. So that's one big part. But the biggest one for me, T-Bone, was where he talked about experience versus leadership. And the quote that really caught me, because we've seen a lot of this talking about, oh, you know, how, how can a Matt Carpenter provide experience if he's sitting on the bench? Or how can a Matt Carpenter provide experience if he's not even playing? And to, to what point you were trying to make in the previous segment, the reason that he was signed and the reason he has the ability and to what Mo said was speak up and say something if he sees something is because he's played in the league for 13 years. And Mo talked about how Nolan Arenado and Paul Goldschmidt took a bulk of that load last season, specifically as the only position players who were the leaders. Wilson Contreras, as Katie Wu told us, came in first year. Can't really say much when you're just getting acclimated to a roster. So people don't like to hear it. People think, think it's an excuse and people think it's the wrong answer. But this was their mindset that they needed somebody who had veteran experience and Mo also said it wasn't just Matt Carpenter it was a veteran player that was available who if something is not right can speak up and say something to this group of players that was the sole purpose of this signing yeah I, I found it interesting when he said that that Goldie Arnold took on the bulk last year said that he had communicated with them they, it's clear they were looking for somebody else to come in and be a part of the veteran leadership right. group and he said that they weren't necessarily just targeting Matt Carpenter kind of like he had said he had kind of said that about Lance Lynn right where it was, it was more of a mutual thing and we really wanted Lance Lynn they, don't be wrong they wanted Matt Carpenter that's why he's under contract but I, I think it actually works out best that it is Carpenter because he has been a St. Louis right. Cardinal uh, the other thing that I found interesting was they had asked him I think that was John Denton I'm not 100 percent sure that asked him about you know He's been working with Matt Holiday in the offseason. Have you guys taken a look at or talked with Matt about his workouts this offseason? And he said, yes, we've been able to find look at the data from his bat speed and exit velocity, which were the two things that kind of started to go for Matt at the end of his time here in St. Louis, that he got back in New York and then kind of got back away from in San Diego. So they clearly like what they're seeing to where they think he can at least probably be, like I said, hopefully a league average bat for them if he does, depending on the amount of at-bats that he does get. And he said that they're not – he said he doesn't know if they're done yet and they are keeping an eye on the pitching market still, which I expected him to say. But I, I think as Katie Wu said when we talked to her as well, I asked her, do you think they're looking for another bullpen piece? She said probably yes. So if I had to guess, there's probably one more move still to come this offseason. Yeah, and you're waiting for a contract to dip down to what they're willing to spend, not go out to the market and just sign somebody because people will say, well, if they were going to do it, they would do it already. Why they're not doing it is because they're offering somebody 2 or $3 million and that player hasn't come to reason yet that that's all they're going to get on the market. So that's why you haven't seen anything. I did also find it interesting that he said, like he's not blocking anybody on the roster. He's not taking anybody's position. They put it into the position that brought him here and they expect him to compete but he's not getting any more at bats than Alec Burleson or Nolan Gorman or Lars Newtbar or anything like that Matt Carpenter is going to be that 26th man on the roster and I know everybody listening to this is like I am skeptical and saying sure talk to me when he's getting everyday playing time in April I mean, let's, if that happens, then we blast this team I, for and, it. And I'll tell you what should happen if they're playing Matt Carpenter every day in April, unless he's on like a tour, like he takes a job and tour pace out of spring training. And even then, I don't know where he has a starting spot, maybe DH. Everybody should be fired then. Absolutely. 
But uh, up until that point, it's made it very clear that Matt Carpenter is here for one role and one role only, and that's finding ways to be a voice in this clubhouse that they obviously lost last season. So that kind of puts a bow on the Matt Carpenter conversation, and if you missed anything from that John Mosaic press conference, you'll be able to check it out after the show today up on our podcast page, 101ESPN.com, presented by Dobbs Tire and Auto Centers. Uh, big thank you to Grant Francis and Mike Ryder uh, busting their butt back in the studios to uh, get that one up online for us today. We'll take a final break. We'll come back with the BK and Ferrari Rewind with a little NFL look ahead next here on 101 ESPN.
right, let's wrap things up on BK and Ferrario with a little BK and Ferrario Rewind NFL Quick Hitters Edition. Tanner Hendricks and Graham Francis, I'm Alex Ferrario. As we've got the divisional round coming up this weekend, Saturday slate, it will be the Texans and Ravens, Packers and 49ers, and then on Sunday, the Buccaneers and Lions, and then the Chiefs and the Bills. Let's start with the one we're most excited about. I think it's all the same. But let's take the Bills and Chiefs out of this one, T-Bone. What's the one you're excited about, not Bills and Chiefs? Uh, I think the other exciting game, and it's the first one of the week, and it's Texans-Ravens. I mean, all these games are exciting, but C.J. Stroud, man, he picked apart the Browns, and they had a really good defense. So I didn't think they were going to be able to do that. Baltimore's got a good defense. Mark Andrews has been ruled out. Had he been able to play, I would look at that Ravens offense a little bit differently. I'm still sticking with the Texans as an upset, man, but I think it's going to be close, and I think C.J. Stroud's gives them a fighting chance against that great team. I love that one. The other one that I'm super excited for is Packers and 49ers. I, I, I've been said that I don't know football when I said that Jordan Love is bad, and he's shown me that I don't know football because he's been really good for the second half of the season and played well in the postseason. But how good are you? Because you're taking on the 49ers defense. And me personally, the Lions are my team right now. The Texans and Lions are my team, and I think the best route for the Lions to get to a Super Bowl is that the Packers take down the 49ers. So that's the other one that I'm most intrigued by. Who's under the most pressure? I, you can I, go team, coach, player, however you want. I, I think the team slash player under the most pressure is Bills and Josh Allen. I, I think Allen, I said this earlier, I don't know if a playoff win does much against Patrick Mahomes for Josh Allen. Why? Because he's being judged more on can he get his team to the Super Bowl. Yeah. And they're at home now. Now Allen, or excuse me, uh, Mahomes is not no longer at his safe place in Kansas City. He's got to go on the road for the first time ever in the playoffs. They got the ground. They got the fans shoveling the stadium again because of the snow that just went through there. Buffalo is under the most pressure. They they need to win this weekend. They're favored against Kansas City, a team that I don't have much faith in, and I honestly am rooting for Buffalo. I I think they're the team. Mine's uh mine's Lamar Jackson. I don't think anything is going to happen to Lamar Jackson. Lamar is probably still going to win the MVP. Lamar is still going to be viewed as a top quarterback in the AFC. But Lamar is going to be 1-4 in the playoffs. And he yeah, has not advanced one. from the divisional round in his career. And I think if Lamar Jackson struggles against C.J. Stroud and the Texans, Lamar Jackson's going to enter the same conversation that Dak Prescott's in of regular season quarterback, but not a postseason quarterback. And that is dangerous for him in terms of the career. Final one. Who's the team you're rooting for? Uh, I find myself, I, you mentioned it just a couple seconds ago, I find myself rooting for the Lions for the rest too, of the Me too, man. I don't know why. I, I, I think it's Dan Campbell. I'm not a fan of golf. I had I experienced golf as a Rams fan. It's Dan Campbell, but it's also like the miserable time that the fans have had of how bad that team has been and it's jared goff it's dan campbell i think their team's exciting i think the fan base it's fun to see them get excited so all of that factors into i'm rooting for, i'm rooting for them so hard and they've got a great offense too when they're playing right i, I think offensively they're really good as well all right let's do this before we get out of here let's make our picks let's start with texans ravens who's the winner i'm going texans man i, I i'm doing I don't texans feel good about the well. ravens offense grant who's your winner Grant might be doing podcasts. I was podcasting. What's the question? Who's the winner, Texans or Ravens? Uh, Ravens. Okay. It's Ravens. Uh, Packers, 49ers. 49ers. I don't even think it's close. Yeah, mine's 49ers. Grant? Yeah, I've got the Thank Niners. You. Okay. Buccaneers, Lions? Lions. 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 Pretty Lions. simple there. And then the final one, Chiefs and Bills. I'm going Bills. I, I think they do it. I think they beat them. Grant? I think the Bills expose some Chiefs weaknesses here. I'm going to go Bills. I'm going Bills as well, man. So we are all on the same page. Texans, Niners, Lions, and Bills. Enjoy divisional round weekend. I will be back with you tomorrow at 6 o'clock for Blues and Washington Capitals pregame starting at 6 o'clock. You can check everything out on our podcast page, 101ESPN.com, presented by Dobbs Tire and Auto Centers. Big thank you to Grant Francis. Big shout-out to T-Bone. I'm Alex. Have a great weekend. We'll talk to you Monday on BK and Ferrario here on 101 ESPN.